Good morning and welcome to your Hillsborough County Board of County Commissioners land use meeting. Will everyone please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and invocation given by Chapter Commissioner White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Attention, salute, pledge. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll guide this board, our staff, and stakeholders as uh, we make uh, decisions that are important for this county and strike and, and uh, seek to strike that balance between uh, property, pri private property rights and um, fostering uh, outstanding communities and neighborhoods throughout our county. As always, Lord, I pray for the members of our armed forces and our first responders, I pray that you'll guide them and keep them safe each and every day. I ask for all these blessings in your heavenly name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Commissioner White. Mr. Moretta, change to the agenda. Good morning, Commissioners. Joe Moretta, Development Services Department. Commissioners, we do have one change to the agenda. It's found on agenda page 13, item F1, application number 20-0064. This application has been continued by staff for the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. Now moving to the agenda, I'm going to the withdrawals and continuances and remands. Item A1, DRI 19-1042. This application is being continued by staff to the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. Item A2, this application is out of order. It's being continued to the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. Item A3, personal appearance 20-0303. This application has been withdrawn by the applicant. Item A4, this application has been being continued by staff to the May 12th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. Item A5, this application is out of order. It's being continued to the June 9th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. Item A6, this application is being continued by staff to the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. Item A7, this application is being continued by staff to the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. Item A8, this application is being continued to the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. as a matter of right. Item A9, this application is out of order. It's being continued to the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. Item A10, the petitioner is requesting a continuance to the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. Item A11, this application is being continued by staff to the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. Item A12, this application is being continued by staff to the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. And then the final one is item A13, DRI 19-0841. This application is being continued by staff to the April 7th board meeting starting at 9 a.m. I have a motion by Commissioner Berman, second by Commissioner White to approve the changes to the agenda. Seeing no further discussion, please record your vote. Motion carried, six to zero. A motion to approve the consent agenda. Motion second. by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner White to approve the consent agenda. Seeing no further discussion, please record your vote. Motion carried, six to zero. If you have any B items on the consent agenda, your items have been approved. Any B items on the consent agenda, your items have been approved. Anyone who intends to present testimony, evidence, or otherwise be heard on any matter scheduled for consideration at today's meeting, please stand and raise your right hand so the clerk can swear you in. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, please be seated. Mr. Beretta. Commissioners, nothing's been pulled from the, um, removed from consent, so that would bring us back to the um, consent agenda itself. Has that been approved? Approved that already. Okay, that's been approved, I'm sorry. That would bring us to C1, which would be the public hearings. Um, item C1 will be presented by the real estate department. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, Alicia Alvarez, Geospatial Land and Acquisition Services. Item C1 is vacate V20-0001. This petition is brought by John and Christy Trevithan, Renee, Marcia, John, Michael, Jelusis, to vacate a portion of a platted 30-foot wide unimproved right-of-way lying between tracks one and four within the plat of Keystone Park Colony. 
as recorded in Platte Book 5, page 55 of Hillsborough County Records. Just shut down. This request is made for future home addition. The proposed vacant area is located north Tarpon Spring Road, West Burl Road in Odessa. The petition was routed to appropriate departments and agencies and there are no objections to the vacating of this right of way. However, Tico is requesting a reservation of a utility easement over the north 25 feet of the proposed vacate area due to facilities maintained and located in that area. Staff recommends approval of this petition request. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address item C1? Anyone wishing to address item C1? Mr. President, motion by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner Overman to approve item C1. I can't vote, my computer just shut down. <laughs> You can't live with them and you can't live without them. <laughs> I think we have a motion and a second to any further discussion. Please record your vote. Motion carried seven to zero. Mr. Beretta. Item C2 is an additional vacating petition that will be presented by real estate department. C2 today is vacate V20005. This is a petition by Transcend Development Corporation to vacate and release a perpetual easement abutting parcels one, two, four, five, six, and nine within the Adams Van Camp Minor Division subdivision, recorded in Survey Book One, page five of the Public Records of Hillsborough County. This request is made in order to replat for future development. The petition was routed to the appropriate departments and agencies, and there were no objections to the vacating of this easement. In addition to the adoption of the resolution, a release and termination of perpetual easement is for execution by the board is requested for title clearing purposes. The subject area is located north of Boyette Road and west of Balm River Road in Riverview. The staff is recommending approval of this petition request. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address item C2? Anyone wishing to address item C2? Close the public hearing. Motion by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner Overman to approve item C2. Seeing no further discussion, please record your vote. Motion carried, seven to zero. Mr. Moretta. Item C3 is a vacating petition that will be presented by the Real Estate Department. C3 is vacate 20008, and this petition is being brought by Joseph and Amy Kowalski and Tibbetts Land LLC to vacate a certain utility easement which was reserved over that portion of previously vacated right of ways, lying in Block U, Platte of Riverview Heights, recorded in Platte Book 9, page 37 of the Public Records of Hillsborough County. This request is made in order to utilize the area for future development. The proposed vacate area is located north of Riverview Drive and east of US Highway 301 in Riverview. The petition was routed to the appropriate departments and agencies and there were no objections to this easement. Staff is recommending approval of this request. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address item C3? Anyone wishing to address item C3? Close the public hearing. Motion by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner Overman to approve item C3. Seeing no further discussion, please record your vote. 
Motion carried, seven to zero. Loretta. Thank you, commissioners. This brings us up to E1. This is a public hearing, personal appearance 19-1512. Uh, the parcel is located 90 feet north of the intersection of West Hillsborough and Montague Avenue. It involves approximately four areas of revision on the site plan. Uh, a couple of them is, two of them is to add uh, cross access, also to move existing access points and to add two additional access points. And Brian Grady is going to walk through the different areas uh, where the access is being uh, modified. Good morning. Is on? Good morning, Brian Grady, uh, Hillsborough County Development Services. Uh, the area of the modification is, is at the northwest corner of Hillsborough Avenue and the Montague. Uh, the, proposed, the proposed changes uh, they're asking for is they're adding a cross access connection in the area noted with one. They're relocating an existing access point from, the air, from that area further north for right and right out only. They're adding a full access point. Uh, donated three along this area and then a right in right out access point on Hillsborough Rand in the area identified as four. Be happy to answer any questions. Applicant. Good morning, Commissioners. David Wright with TSP Companies. Our address is P.O. Yep. Box 1016, Tampa, Florida, 33601. Um, oh, Brian. Oh. He has 15 minutes. That would 15, 15. Okay. Brian already adequately covered everything I was going to go over. Uh, we are in agreement with the conditions of approval, and I'm here to answer any questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, this is a public hearing. Are there any proponents wishing to speak on item E1? Any proponents? Any opponents wish to speak on item E1? You wave your vote yes. of time, I guess. Yes, Motion by Commissioner Merman. Second. Second by Commissioner White to approve item E1. See no further discussion. Please record your vote. Ready to answer. Motion carried, seven to zero. Loretta. This brings us up to item E2. This is a public hearing. Personal appearance 20-0196, located 130 feet southwest of the intersection of South Falkenberg Road and Progress Boulevard. Commissioners, this is a modification to the PD site plan dealing with access. The parcel is located on the southwest corner of Progress Boulevard and Falkenberg Road. Israel Monsanto is going to walk through the access changes. Good morning, Commissioners. Israel Monsanto Development Services. On your screen on the left, you have the current plan development approved plan for parcel A, which is a subject site. Currently, there is a, a shared access facility, which is uh, it would be developed between the two parcels and is also providing cross access. With this PRS, the applicant is proposing to shift the shared access facility to the north to be only on parcel A, but still providing cross access to the parcel to the south. That's basically the uh, changes being proposed. Applicant here. Morning, you have 15 minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman. Board members, I'm Michael Horner, 14502, Northdale Mabry Highway, Tampa 33618. Bottom line, the south property owner decided to waive and abandon their access that would be shared with ours. They have a wetland and a stormwater management system so we have to move this access further north onto my client's property. We will still offer a connection, even though it's going to connect to a wetland. Staff supports. We appreciate your support as well. Thank you. Thank you, sir. This is a public hearing. Anyone wish to address item E2 as a proponent? Anyone as a proponent? Anyone wish to address item E2 as an opponent? Any opponents? Close the public hearing. Motion by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner Overman to approve item E2. Seeing no further discussion, please record your vote. Motion carried, seven to zero. Thank you, board. Mr. Moretta. Thank you, commissioners. This brings us to public hearing. This is E3 on the agenda. Personal appearance 20-0341, located at 13396 East US Highway 92. This is an amendment to a plan development. Plan development has a maximum building height applicable to park pocket B, which is 25 feet. The applicant is proposing to move that to 36 feet for two specific areas of the site plan. One of them is for a fire water tower in the other is for a vehicle service center. Um, that height, uh, the additional height is sought for both of those structures. Staff is recommending approval with conditions. Uh, I should add that those structures are, are, are located internal to the site, um, and we are recommending approval. Applicant. Good morning. 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioner, staff, Todd Pressman, 200 2nd Avenue South in uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, number 451. Uh, this request, as uh, Joe mentioned, is interior to the site. We're 200 plus feet from the property lines. The FAR is many times below what's allowed by code. Uh, this is for General RV, um, an outstanding operator throughout the state. This is their premier site and they're thrilled to be a part of Hillsborough County. We have uh, support from the staff. Um, I received a couple calls just questioning or just asking what the request is for, but no opposition. And again, your staff is in support. We appreciate your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, this is a public hearing. Anyone wants you to speak as a proponent? Any proponents? Anyone wishes to speak as an opponent? Any opponents? Close the public hearing. Motion by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner Kemp to approve item E3. See no further discussion. Please record your vote. Motion carried seven to zero. Thank you. Mr. Moretta. Commissioners, this is item E4, public hearing, personal appearance 20-0387. Um, this is located 40 feet southeast of the intersection of 12th Street Southeast and 14th Avenue Southeast. Um, commissioners, this is a approximately 49 acre parcel and it's a plan development. There's a modification proposed to the plan development site planning conditions to modify the lot orientation along 12th Street um, to reduce the landscaping buffer from 20 to 10 feet along 14th Avenue, add access and modify design of pedestrian access and also modify the internal site design for the uh, roadway. Mr. Israel Monsanto of our staff is gonna walk through the site plan and, and, and orient uh, the board to the changes. My name is Israel Monsanto Development Services. Commissioners to your left, you have the currently approved PD plan, which has these three access points here and then across access to the north. The applicant is proposing the same access connection, but is also asking, uh, adding a cross access to the east on this location. These lots in the current plan are fronting 12th Street. The applicant is proposing to have those uh, switch internally to fronting internal roadways. The, uh, there is a 20 foot buffer currently approved on the north side of 14th Avenue. The applicant is proposing to reduce the buffer. There is also a gated pedestrian connection approved today. The applicant is maintaining the pedestrian connection, but it's, it's not, it will not be gated. He's uh, the applicant is removing the gate. Um, additionally, you can see the uh, internal roadway um, network is being changed slightly. It has a, a different layout. And this cool de sac is being eliminated. And again, the uh, access to the east is being proposed. Am I will have any questions? Okay, see no questions, applicant. Good morning. Good morning, Elise Batzel, Stearns Weaver Miller, 401 East Jackson Street, Suite 2100. Um, uh, Israel did a very nice job. And I just wanted to let you know that we have worked with staff on a condition in lieu of the second sentence of 5.1 which says no fencing. Because of the way that we are orienting the lots, people's backyards will be exposed to streets. And so in lieu of the second sentence of five, condition 5.1, uh, we propose the following. Along 12th Street Southeast, 14th Avenue Southeast, and 15th Street Southeast, a green space buffer of 10 feet in width shall be provided. The green space buffer shall be developed with street uh, street trees staggered 20 feet on center and fences may be provided on the interior side of the buffer. The buffer shall be platted as a separate parcel and owned and maintained by an HOA or similar entity. Yes, ma'am. That's it? You're That's done? it. We're available for any questions. Okay, thank, thank you, you for your consideration. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address this as a proponent? Anyone as a proponent? Anyone wishing to address this as an opponent? Any opponents? You wave your time. Mr. Overman, you recognize. Um, actually, I just want to ask you a quick question just to clarify what I think I just heard. Yes, uh, so you are prohibiting any fences at the buffer line, but you're permitting fences on the 12th Street to on the actual property owner's property? Yes. So as you know, the Ruskin Community Plan says no walls or segregating features. Um, but the, because of the orientation of many of these lots, their backyard will be up to the, the street. And so to allow there to be fencing for children playing and pets and things in the backyard, we're proposing that fences are permitted along these streets, but that 
the fences will be on the interior of this buffer. We, and then it prescribes the conditions of the buffer. And the height restriction for those Whatever fences? is currently permitted by code, which I believe is six feet. I'm sorry? Whatever is currently permitted by code, which I believe is six feet. We're not asking for any waivers of the height to fence. Okay, because I, I, I liked the project until you turned it around. Because um, then it, it really does, and if you still permit fencing, you separate from the rest of the community in the area. Um, well, let me, let me just also comment. If you look at some of the changes, and we didn't go over those in detail but because Israel Monsanto did, but we have actually added connectivity to the east. Uh, we have taken a pedestrian pathway that was gated, and we've removed the gate to incorporate additional connectivity. So the intent isn't really to segregate the community. It's um, to open it up with those particular features, but it's also to allow private property owners to be able to have a fence in their yard because of the way that those lots are oriented. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Mr. Smith, you recognize. Uh, thank yes, you. Ma'am, sorry. Um, so the only fencing that will be allowed is the each individual homeowner to provide their own, or does this? No, what the concern was, and we worked with staff in this right. condition, the concern was that some homeowners might put up a fence and some not along certain streets, mm -hmm. and then you have this very odd open, closed, open, closed. So for consistency and to provide an aesthetically pleasing sort of row, that was the reason that the fences go on the inside of the buffering along these particular streets, and that would be their backyard, and then the buffering would be to the outside of the street. So as you're riding, riding down the street, you don't just have a fence. You have some nice nice buffering and trees and sod and ground cover. Mm, that's not how I understood it because all right, the Ruskin Community Plan uh, says no walls or uh, gates for a few reasons. We want, um, and, and as you know, I was deeply involved in the writing of this. So. Um, First of all, connectivity. We, want to, we don't want to have to drive around big uh, subdivisions. We want to be able to drive through, and this does provide that. Um, but also to prevent that, uh, so that our uh, community doesn't turn into a maze of walled uh, canyons um, where you're not like, you don't have the open neighborhood community feeling like you do where most of you live, um, you know, so that it's not segregated visually by these uh, walled canyons. I understand that in this instance, the, um, because the, the, the development across 12th Street already had their, has their backyards facing the street, uh, it, it makes sense to allow this side of the street to do the same thing, but um, I would prefer to have it just left it, to remove the restriction for individual homeowners, but not to allow one steady gate to be put up um, all, I mean, one steady wall that could in, end up being a six foot um, wall after all, but just 10 feet in. Um, and frankly, the Ruskin community plan, when we were writing it, we, like a lot of communities, were hoping to have a mix of home types instead of just the cookie cutter beige boxes that you get in when you do a whole lot at one time. And so, you know, letting each homeowner have a fenced backyard if they've got a dog or a, a child, but um, maybe the next one doesn't. One's a picket fence, one's a chain link fence, one's wooden, whatever, would add to that diversity um, and still allow the private property rights without saying, come on, we're just gonna do it 10 feet in and have a wall. I guess part of the concern and what we were working with staff on is to the maintenance of those areas. Mm -hmm. um, to the extent that you have it maintained, this strip by a homeowner's association or similar entity, you can be sure that these trees and these landscaping are being um, maintained in a fashion that keeps them viable and, and beautiful for the community, uh, rather than relying on individual homeowners to a plant, plant it appropriately and maintain it appropriately. Um, <laughs> 
Thank you. We, we really are not looking for um, uniformity as much as uh, allowing individuality. And, and I'd like to ask um, Ms. Leinhardt if she has any comments to this um, from the perspective of the comprehensive plan, which the Ruskin Community Plan is part of. Sure. Thank you, Melissa Leinhardt, Planning Commission staff. We did review this PRS at the request of Development Services for Comprehensive Plan <clears throat> Consistency. Um, and as you mentioned, this item is specifically mentioned in the Ruskin Community Plan. Uh, the language reads exactly, encourage development that is connected with and integrated into the Ruskin community. Design features, e.g. walls, gates, that isolate or segregate development from the community is inconsistent with the community's character and should be discouraged. Um, we made a comment um, in an email to Israel Monsanto of Development Services that while the Ruskin Community Plan does not address fences on individually platted lots, it does address isolating subdivisions from the surrounding community as part of Goal 5, which I just read. And then we further stated that a condition eliminating a fence along 12th Street would further PRS's 20-0387's consistency with the Ruskin Community Plan. But from our perspective, that fence was an individual fence on individual properties, not a fence surrounding an entire mm -hmm. development created by the builder from the get-go that wasn't shown on the site plan. So we would concur with you that we would like to leave it up to the individual lot owner. Mm -hmm. um, so therein, it does, it does not segregate on one holistic level. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Smith, I'm going to go back because I actually drafted the condition um, and staff had concerns about individuals, so I changed the condition. So I'm going to go read into the record and uh, submit this to, for your consideration what I had originally drafted to address this. If fences are constructed, if fences are constructed along the perimeter, a green space of each, we can put in there of each lot, a green space buffer of 10 feet in width shall be provided on the exterior of the fence. The green space buffer shall be developed with street trees staggered 20 feet on center. The remainder of the buffer shall be planted with shrubs, ground cover, or, sh or sod. That means each individual, this was written so that each individual homeowner could put those fences up for their children and safety. I was, with the revised condition, I was really trying to address the conditions of staff, but I understand that that isn't what the board would like. So um, I'd replace what I originally submitted with this new condition for your consideration if you choose to consider that condition. Commissioner, just for clarification on that, so the way that condition is presented here would work is there would be variable buffers. Some lots would have them, some lots would not, but you're not going to have a platted buffer with plantings as you as you typically see you're proposing a buffer with trees on 20 foot centers on a lot by lot basis. Is, is that I correct? understand. Is, it, that, is that the intent of that? The intent of that original condition was to, to provide a buffer outside the fence to it, on an individual lot basis to the extent that individual homeowners wanted to put up a fence, they would have to comply with this condition. I think that's what I'm hearing from Commissioner Smith is that that's what she'd like to see. And we worked with staff to, to make it more uniform so that we could ensure maintenance, but I, that seems to not be the pleasure of the board. So that condition is implementable. I just want to clarify that that is not the way that buffers would typically be provided. It would be on an individual homeowner by homeowner basis that when they're putting up a fence, they're then required to put and maintain the landscape buffer. If that's, if that's the board, what the board, if the board would so, so like that, that can be implemented. It's a little different than, than how it would typically be implemented because fences in of themselves don't require permits. So homeowner can just go up and put up a fence. So it would be something that the developer would have to put homeowners on notice of, or we would have to, um, you know, identify situations where it was done and consistent with the zoning and, and, and take it up with the individual homeowner. Thank you. It's, it's not as important to me that, you know, if somebody does this differently, it, it's, um, but I think consistent with the Ruskin community plan and what we're looking for there, this would uh, be the best way to get at letting individual homeowners put a fence without having some uh, standardized um, look along the street. Commissioner Smith, do you want to leave it to the homeowner for what that buffer looks like? Or I, I guess the question would be, um, under your scenario, if individual property owners are responsible for putting up the fence, 
would you prefer not to have that buffer requirement or have the buffer requirement without specifications so that they could plant whatever they wanted to in there? I don't if, see if, why not. If, I mean, if, 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 there's, if there's no specification of what gets planted in the buffer, um, we really won't have anything to regulate for that. So if, if the board is, is, is um, amenable to potentially fences being 10 feet in from the lot line and having um, sod down, um, you know, the ground, we will require the ground to be stabilized mm -hmm. uh, as, to, as to individual landscaping if there's something prescribed in the conditions and we would, we would regulate to that and if it was left up to the individual homeowner and we really, it, it's not really something that we'd have clarity on being able to regulate the saying they're in compliance or, or not in compliance. Mm -hmm. I, I think that gets us uh, more of the individuals. Are you hearing anything, Ms. Leinhart, that could run into trouble with this? Um, um, thank you, Melissa Leinhardt, Planning Commission staff. I do not see an issue either way, to be honest. I, I see Adam's point with not being able to regulate what goes inside of that buffer, so some could be empty. And some could have, you know, could be planted full of trees. So they would not look uniform, I think, by nature, unless that was coordinated effort. Um, so I do see the, um, the inability to enforce what goes in the buffer if you don't specify what goes in the buffer. But from a community plan perspective, I don't think it matters to us either way. And, and I think the, actually having been in the Ruskin community plan, we had a lot of discussions about, you know, letting everybody uh, do what they want on their property so we have a, uh, a variety. If someone wants a rose garden, if someone wants a vegetable garden, if somebody wants just uh, sod, that's um, fine with it from the community plan standpoint. So I think we're good. So Adam, should I read what I think the condition is or would you that, like to? No, I think it'd be helpful if you like sure. to read what so, you're proposing. So I think um, really all we have to do now is eliminate the second sentence of condition 5.2, which prohibits fencing. Is that correct, Israel? I'm sorry, 5.1. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you wanted to have it so that it was 10 feet in on the lot, I believe you'd have to oh, yes, specify I'm sorry. that. Mm -hmm. OK. You want to say something else? Well, I was just going to go ahead. specify. If, if fences are constructed on the perimeter of each property, a green space buffer of 10 feet in width shall be provided. That sentence would be in lieu of the second sentence of condition 5.1, which prohibits fencing. Sounds good. I'll move the item. Most Thank you for Commissioner your time. Smith, second by Commissioner Kemp to approve item E4. Uh, Commissioner Overman, you recognize? Yeah, I just have a quick question. I think part of the issue is the height because if you've got a six foot fence it feels like a wall um is there are there any provisions anywhere in our code that suggest a, a shorter than six foot height because if you had a, a you know a four foot height or a five foot height you still keep a child inside uh, or an animal inside you know dogs and cats and those kinds of things well maybe not cats but <laughs> dogs <laughs> and children you know inside someone's yard but you don't have a wall and so if, if what was originally proposed, not that I'm going to go back to what you originally okay. suggested, were a shorter fence that was, you know, less barrier-wise, like not a big, huge plywood fence, you know, or, or a board fence, but some kind of attractive fence that actually was lower in height that did, didn't eliminate that visual, you know, barrier, um, that, that's kind of where I was kind of going. So if we're going to have to have a separation from the community across the street, like make it less walled off, which was what I thought I understood the community plan to imply. Um, but if, you know, if the, if it were a lower height and more transparent or, or less of a barrier, would that get us where we're, what, what, what the developer of the community want, was trying to accomplish? I, I mean, I don't want to go back on what was no, no. just agreed to, but I, I just thought we might be able to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish with a lower, more ornamental type of fence that still provided a safety barrier for animals and children. The, I don't know what the for, rules are as yeah. far as fences are concerned. In, in required front yards, fences are limited to four feet in height. 
they're allowed to go up to six feet in side yards and rear yards and also front yards that function as rear yards. So if you have a three lot on both streets, each side of that would be considered a front yard. However, in that front yard that functions as a rear so that the house isn't oriented that it allows six feet. Otherwise, it is a four foot limit for four front yards. That's what I was thinking. This is more like a front yard because it's facing the street, even though the houses have now been turned around. So that's why I was asking. So just to clarify, it sounds like that provision would would yeah. segregate at a lower level. But what you were saying, Commissioner Smith, is that in the community plan, your intent at least was that each homeowner could do what they wanted. Yeah. Um, I think that would be our inclination uh, from the applicant based okay. on the overall discussion. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you Mr. very much. Mr. White, you're recognized. So are you still proposing that an HOA or some similar entity control that 10 foot buffer? No, sir. In this scenario? Okay. No, if it wasn't a consistent buffer along a long swath of roadway, we would leave that to the private homeowners, okay. um, which it sounds like um, it would be more consistent with the community plan to allow each homeowner to do what they want on their property in that area. But if the buffer is provided, it does provide areas so that the fences aren't right up against the street. Right. I, I'll just I'll just say for the record that um, I, I think um, as far as aesthetics of the community are concerned, I like the original proposal better. Um, but um, in deference to Commissioner Smith, that was so involved in, in the drafting of this Ruskin community plan, you know, I'm going to support the motion on the floor with uh, with the revised condition. Commissioner Merman, you recognize. Um, thank you. This will be brief. Um, Commissioner White, I agree with you. I think the original um, uh, plan proposed um, is best for the aesthetics and for property values. Um, for the years I've sat on this board, I can't tell you how many complaints we've had about fences and um, disparities between one yard and the next. And I think this will be a breeding ground for um, people to complain. Somebody that has a very nice fence and somebody puts up a, um, not a barbed wire, but a steel type. I mean, it's just, this is common sense. Um, and I think maybe this is something that needs to be looked at in the community plan to allow for flexibility because I think that this is something that um, definitely for aesthetics, like Commissioner White said, but um, in, since we have the community plan the way it is today and it is worded that way, I mean, I am going to vote to approve it because I don't want to see this um, not be approved, but I think um, this is opening up kind of a hornet's nest for the future if we continue uh, to do these and not look at the aesthetics or the privacy issues um, and also neighbor issues uh, that can come up in relation to this. Commissioner Kemp, you recognize. Thank you, I'll be fast too. Um, but I really appreciate, it's, it's great to have someone here who was involved in the community plan so deeply and to know that there were those actual discussions and considerations that took place. I think it would be, um, uh, you know, Contrary to the community plan to uh, have what is basically an in internal wall, which w would have been an external wall otherwise, it, um, that strikes me as being true. I also can appreciate diversity, um, but I do think there are times when, I mean, I live in a neighborhood where people can plant whatever they want. There's no HOA or anything like that um, and put up whatever fence they want. Uh, but um, I can see where sometimes there are uh, issues with with neighbors, but I, you know, I, I'm not sure how you uh, deal with those kinds of um, individual decisions. So, uh, you know, I'm just glad to have you here. I'll support this now, but you know, if there's more discussion to be had about a way to uh, maybe look at something, something else, I think that's something that could be done in the future. And, and commissioners, if I just clarify the question, this 10 foot buffer will be part of the homeowner's lot. So the 10 feet on the outside of the fence will be the maintenance responsibility of each individual 
homeowner so to keep it mowed and trimmed and so forth just want to make sure that that part is clear on the record it's not a buffer like you typically have okay we have a motion by commissioner smith second by commissioner kemp if you no further discussion please record your vote motion carried seven to zero thank you for Ms. your time Moretta. thank you commissioners this brings us to e5 it's a public hearing personal appearance 20-0393 this is for a modification of a planned development in parcel one of Summerfield Crossings. It's located on the uh, northeast corner of 301 and, and Summerfield Drive. Uh, the, the petitioner is seeking a, a right in, right out access point to Summerfield Drive. St our transportation staff has reviewed it and recommended approval. Brian Gray, Grady is going to orient you in terms of the location of the, of the uh, proposed access. Good morning, Commissioners. Brian Grady, Hillsborough County Development Services. Uh, the subject Good morning, Commissioner. Can you? Now, can you hear me? Okay. Again, Brian Grady, Hillsborough County Development Services. Uh, the parcel that's the subject of the modification is identified in red within the Somerville uh, plan development. Uh, again, what they're proposing is at the, on the south side of the property along Somerville Crossings Boulevard to add a right in right out only onto uh, Somerville Crossings Boulevard. The parcel will also take access off of the internal access drive that's on the eastern side of the property. Be happy to answer any questions. Applicant. Good morning, you have 15 minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Commissioners. Uh, my name is David Mechanic, 305 South Boulevard. I'm here on behalf of the applicant LG 301 LLC. The staff, I think, did a uh, um, um, perfectly good job of describing what we are proposing. It is a single access driveway. I would just point out that even though Summerfield Crossings will be dedicated to the public, it is uh, internal to the development, the Summerfield development. Um, we concur with the condition uh, uh, proposed by staff, and we're here to answer any questions you may have. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak as a proponent on E5? Anyone wishing to speak as a proponent on E5? Any opponents wishing to speak on item E5? Any opponents? Close the public hearing. Motion by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner Kemp to approve item E5. I've seen the further discussion. Please record your vote. Motion carried six to zero. Mr. Moretta. Thank you, commissioners. This brings us up to items E6 and E7. Brian Grady of our staff will make the presentations. These are two community development district items. Good morning, commissioners. Brian Grady, Hillsborough County Development Services uh, Department. Uh, item E5, CDD 20-0279 is a petition to expand the Sherwood Manor Community Development District. Uh, the petition has been submitted by Sherwood Manor CDD to expand the CDD by adding approximately 14.11 acres of the CD, CDD. The revised CDD would accomplish uh, approximately 179.72 acres and is located east of 6th Street Southeast between 16th Avenue Southeast on the north and 21st Avenue Southeast on the south side in Ruskin. No objections to the pro CDD were raised by reviewing agencies. Uh, staff finds the application meets the requirements of Chapter 190 Florida statutes to expand the community development district and recommends approval of the available for questions. Thank you. Thank you. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to speak as a proponent on item E6? Any proponents on item E6? Any opponents on item E6? Any opponents? Seeing none, public hearing is closed. Motion by Commissioner Merman. Second. Second by Commissioner White to approve item E6. Seeing no further discussion, please record your vote. Motion carried six to zero. Ms. Moretta. Next item is item E7, CDD 20-0355, petition to establish the Berry Bay Community Development District. The petition has been submitted by 301 Waimama LLC to establish the Berry Bay CDD. The Berry Bay CDD will accomplish approximately 361.82 acres and is located between US 301 and State Road 579 and south of Bonita Drive and north of Saffold Road in Waimama. No objections to the pro CDD were raised by reviewing agencies. Staff finds the application meets the requirements of Chapter 190 Florida Staffs to establish a community development district and recommends their approval. Available for any questions. Thank you, sir. This is a public hearing. Anyone wishing to address item E7 as a proponent? Any proponents? Any opponents on item E7? Any opponents? Public hearing is closed. 
Motion by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner White to approve item E7. Seeing no further discussion, please record your vote. Motion carried, seven to zero. Mr. Moretta. Thank you, commissioners. This brings us to the portion of the agenda where we have petitions with no oral argument filed, but we have distinctions in detail in terms of the um, various recommendations. F1 was continued, that brings us to F2. This is a rezoning, a proposal for a plan development 20-0069. The background on this case is that it was rezoned to RSC9 with a restriction. Uh, that restriction limited the lot sizes to 7,200 square feet. That particular zoning is being sought to be rezoned to plan development. The purpose of the plan development is not to achieve additional entitlements nor is it uh, intended to reduce that lot size. The purpose of it is to reduce the setbacks to accommodate front porches and side-loaded garages. Um, as part of that plan development, more detail on the plan uh, was required. Staff is recommending approval of, the, of, of this zoning um, with conditions and the site plan as well, but as part of that site plan process, when the applicant applied for PD, uh, the detail was necessary to show the connectivity to various lot lines. Um, as part of the review, uh, a, a distinction in detail came out between our recommendation, which is approval subject to conditions, including the site plan, and the zoning hearing master's recommendation. There is a, uh, a question about a connection to the west of the site. Um, previously, there was a uh, zoning condition that required screening along that property line. And there is now a question about the screening that will be provided in the area where the roadway connection is proposed. In our recommendation, we are recommending that the access be provided by, um, in, in a typical standard, which would require the pavement to go to the property line because the pavement is going to the property line to accommodate future cross access. There will not be any screening across the right of way. Um, it is a private right of way, but nonetheless, we treat it as right of way and then right away, we don't allow the construction of fences or screening or buffering. Um, in the zoning hearing master's recommendation, the zoning hearing master deferred it to working with transportation department to accommodate a screening and buffering scenario. So that's the distinction between our recommendations. Johanna may get more into detail on the zoning hearing recommendation itself. The applicant, or excuse me, the application has all approvals in consistency with the plan. However, there's a distinction in detail. No oral argument has been filed, but that's why it's on this portion of the agenda. We're available for questions if you Snuggle, have. Do you want to address the zoning hearing master's uh, recommendation? Um, yes, uh, com commissioners. I'll summarize the distinction uh, between the ZHM recommendation and uh, what development services is recommended. Uh, the ZHM did look at the overall project and found it to be uh, consistent with the plan and code. Uh, the ZHM did note that the proposed PD site plan addresses connectivity through roadway stub out to the east and west. And the ZHM noted that neighbors adjacent and to the west of the project expressed concern for the uh, break in the proposed 10-foot buffer and screening along the west boundary in order to accommodate the 50-foot width um, right-of-way stub out, including its associated pavement. The zoning hearing master recommended that this concern be addressed through a modified recommended condition of approval that would provide for an allowance to hold the roadway pavement short of the west property line and allow for the buffer and screen to be continuous in the north-south direction along the west property line until such time as the uh, cross connection, paved uh, connection is extended across that property line. Um, again, notwithstanding that um, distinction, the zoning hearing master recommended approval and um, provided a recommendation for a change to condition three to accommodate the condition, the con continuation, excuse me, of the buffer and screen along the west boundary through the um, right of way roadway stub out that's um, planned for eventual connection. And I believe staff um, has a condition that's slightly. Um, 
specific. Uh, commissioners, we can discuss that condition. The way the hearing master wrote this was a little bit, um, uh, put us in a little bit of an unusual position. We've made a recommendation, and the hearing master has made a recommendation that we relook at the condition. We do have some suggestions that try to uh, bridge what we've recommended, what we're trying to accomplish with that, and the hearing master's recommendation. So the, the condition currently has the road stubbed out and constructed to the property line. If there is vegetation to be planted in there, the, the two can't coexist. However, if a, a fence were to be installed at the edge of that right-of-way line, that could be installed over, um, over the paved stub out. The alternative would be to not pave the stub out to the property line. Um, what we found in, in, in the past is that poses some challenge if there is going to be some future connection if there's a gap in pavement. So that's, that's kind of our struggle with trying to come up with a, a, a recommendation of how to implement the hearing master's recommendation. However, again, a fence across that paved right-of-way um, could accomplish that. Something short of that would, I think, necessitate not paving all the way up to the property boundary. So you have a recommendation different from the zoning hearing master. You're trying to work it out at this particular point in time. Am I right? Yes, sir. So should we be voting on this now? Or are you going to work on it and bring it back? What, should, what, what do you want to do? Well, the hearing master, it's done from the hearing master. We're trying to discern what the hearing master had in mind with, with the recommended condition that differed from, from our recommendation. I think if the board was inclined to go with that recommendation, a fence across that, that right of way to, to provide the screening could coexist while it, with it being paved. The, the planning of the landscaping within that road would, would, would not. So it, if we were to recommend something that would, that would bridge what we're trying to accomplish or what we're recommending and what the hearing master's recommended would be that screening would be provided over that paved right of way, but only with a, with a fence for the screen. Mr. Smith, you recognize. Thank you. I think it's important for everybody in the neighborhood to understand there's a stub out here um, so that later on there's not any, um, uh, you know, objections when, if and when a connect, connection can ever be made. Um, you, you have less problems down the road. Um, and, and to have the stub out go all the way to the property line. Um, the, the people on the other side of that property boundary can plant whatever they want if they don't like the look of the stub out um, there. Um, but I, I, I'm hoping that we can stick with the original conditions um, and, and do what is standard and what we usually do, and that is put the stub out all the way to the property, property line. And, not even not try to hide it. Commissioner White, you recognize. Well, I was inclined to move Mr. Gormley's recommended condition. Uh, is, I mean, is that? I'll I'll, I'll move Mr. Gormley's recommended. Move the item with Mr. Gormley's uh, suggested condition relating to the stub out. So, so the condition Hold will on. be that. Wait a minute. Sorry. Let's, let's do this thing in order, okay? We have a motion by Commissioner White, second by Commissioner Murma. Com Mr. Gormley, would you state your condition, please? The, the, the condition would read in, as an amendment to condition number three a six foot high PVC fence shall be provided across the stubbed out right of way and shall be removed at such time as the right of way is connection, right of way will be connected to the adjacent property. Commissioner White, is that what you understand? Commissioner Murm, is that what you understand? And Commissioner Oldman, you recognize? So the road would go directly to that PVC, uh, that fence, correct? correct? It was very obvious that a road is going to be to 
of fronts. Correct. In fact, if the, the, the fence, if, the, if the road is stubbed out to the property line, mm -hmm. the fence would be going over that paved stub out on the road. And out then, beyond the fence to the property line because there's a setback, correct? Um, the, the fence will be... Um, Yes. It could it could be anywhere within that that ten feet. Okay. Yeah, because I was going to actually support the zoning master's um, recommendation, but this sounds like a reasonable compromise. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner White, second by Commissioner Merman. See any further discussion? Please record your vote. Motion carried seven to zero. Mr. Moretta. Thank you, commissioners. This brings us to G1 on the regular agenda. Uh, this rezoning PD-20-0101, located at 30 feet southwest of 1301. the intersection of Joe Ebert Road and Timmins Road. Current zoning of the parcel, which is 36 acres, is RSC2 AR and RSC2 with a restriction. The RSC2 permits a minimum half acre lot. The AR permits uh, one unit per five acres. The request is for a plan development. This is located in the urban service area. The plan development is seeking to allow 133 lots with a minimum lot size of 6,000 square feet. Um, staff is recommending approval of this case and oral argument has been filed. I have a motion to open for oral argument. Motion back Mr. Murmur, second back Mr. White. Open for oral argument. Seeing no further discussion, please record your vote. Motion carried seven to zero. Applicant. Good morning, you have 10 minutes. Good morning. For the record, I am David Wright, president of TSP Companies, and our address is PO Box 1016, Tampa, Florida, 33601. I'm presenting a request to rezone five parcels totaling approximately 36 acres of land from residential single family conventional RSC2 and RSC2 restricted and agricultural rural to plan development. Subject property is located within the urban service area and Planning Commission and Development Services staff have found the request to be appropriate infill development. The Zoning Hearing Master also recommended approval subject to conditions. There are no wetlands located on the subject property, and the property is not mapped as significant wildlife habitat, and a biological assessment confirmed there are no threatened or endangered species on the subject property. The project design team that participated in the development of this PD application are TSP companies, myself and Timothy Powell as planners, Level Up Consulting, Trent Stevenson for civil engineering and site planning, Naylor Environmental Solutions, Abby Naylor for Biological Site Assessment, and Razor Transportation Consulting's Mike Razor for Transportation Analysis. We began working on this PD application in June 2019. We participated in a PD zoning pre-application meeting with Development Services and Planning Commission staffs in August 2019. And prior to filing the PD zoning application, we held a community information meeting in September 2019 utilizing the county's public notice mailing list. This request is to rezone the property to plan development to allow 131 single family detached units with minimum lot sizes varying from 6,000 square feet to 8,400 square feet with lot dimensions of 50 by 120 and 70 by 120. The, uh, we're gonna use the Elmo for this portion. Uh, the PD was designed to take advantage of the following existing and proposed features in order to achieve an acceptable level of compatibility with the surrounding properties. The proposed lot depths throughout the PD are 120 feet. Most of the lots along the PD's eastern boundary are proposed to be located adjacent to the existing stormwater management pond, providing a substantial buffer between the existing ASC1 residences and the PD. The existing Timmins Road right-of-way, which varies in width from 21 feet to 33 feet and is fenced along Joe Ebert Road, is also located between the proposed PD and the ASC1 properties to the east providing a buffer between the proposed PD and the larger lots to the east that are located outside of the urban service area. The PD stormwater management pond is proposed to be located at the southwest corner of the PD to provide a substantial buffer to the Toulon subdivision to the west and south. There is also an existing 30 foot wide drainage easement within the Toulon subdivision and along the PD's south and west boundaries that provides additional separation between the proposed PD and the Toulon home, home sites. Uh, the land development code does not require any buffering or screening to be provided. However, the PD is proposing to provide tape, type A screening between the PD and the Toulon development in addition to the existing six foot tall vinyl fencing. Joe Ebert Road is designated as a suburban scenic corridor, corridor requiring a 15 foot minimum landscape buffer along the project's Joe Ebert frontage 
and the PD is proposing to increase the buffer width to 25 feet to provide additional buffering and screening to the ASC1 zone properties on the north side of Joe Ebert Road. Additionally, the proposed homes adjacent to the Joe Ebert Road will be placed so that the side yards face Joe Ebert Road, except for the residential tracks A and B that will be retained by the owners of the adjacent properties with folios 61507-2100 and 61507-2200. And this will preserve the existing character along Joe Ebert Road. The landscape and hardscape along Joe Ebert Road will be designed with rural character, including a fence design consistent with rural areas of the county, such as Keystone, Odessa, and Lutz. And the proposed homes adjacent to the existing AS1 zone properties on the west side of the PD will be restricted to single story. The PD is proposing 6,000 square foot minimum lot sizes, but will also include 8,400 square foot lots adjacent to the ASC1 zone properties located to the east of the PD. The applicant is not requesting any plan development variations for site design. The comprehensive plan policy 1.4 defines compatibility as the characteristics of different uses or activities or design which allow them to be located near or adjacent to each other in harmony. Compatibility does not mean the same as, rather it refers to the sensitivity of a development proposal and maintaining the character of existing development. As previously stated, the proposed PD is located within the urban service area and proposed to connect to public water and sewer systems. Subject property is located in unincorporated Hillsborough County, and if approved, the developer will be required to pay parks and school impact fees and transportation mobility fees. And the school impact fees will be at the new rates that the board approved last week. Hillsborough County Public School staff confirmed capacity would currently exist at McDonald Elementary, Jennings Middle School, and Armwood High Schools, taking into account the students that would be generated by the proposed development. Environmental Protection Commission staff conducted an inspection of the site and confirmed that no wetlands or other surface waters exist within the subject property, and EPC staff does not object to the plan development. Planning Commission staff's review concluded in a finding that the request is consistent with the comprehensive plan and the Thanona Sass Community Plan. Specifically, although the applicant is not maximizing the density that could be developed under the Res 4 future land use, the proposed PD does meet the minimum density requirement under policy 1.2. Buffering and screening above the county's minimum requirements is proposed to be utilized to mitigate any impacts to the surrounding rural residential lots. The comprehensive plan policies in the Thanos Asset Community Plan encourage diversity of lot sizes and mitigation of lots and new development adjacent to lower density uses. The adopted definition of compatibility indicates it does not mean the same as, rather it refers to the sensitivity of development proposal and maintaining the character of existing development. The overall area contains mostly residential uses, inclusive of various housing types and densities ranging from manufactured homes to estates, and a planned development rezoning with single family residential lots is compatible with the existing development pattern. The request would encourage development that complements the surrounding character of the area. At this time, I would like to ask Mike Razor to provide an explanation of the transportation analysis and the administrative variance that was approved by the county engineer. Um, hold on just a second, hold on. What's your name, sir? Uh, Michael Razor. He's not on the list. Um, Mr. Razor is a part of the applicant's team and okay. prepared the transportation. You didn't have it on the list. Okay, go ahead, proceed. Thank you. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Again, my name is Michael Razor, and I'm a registered professional engineer with a specialization in traffic at 19046 Bruce B. Downs Boulevard, number 308, Tampa 33647. I was responsible for preparing the traffic study that accompanies this rezoning request and also the administrative variance that speaks of the condition of Joe Ebert Road. In regard to the traffic study, we evaluated traffic operating conditions and found that Joe Ebert Road and the intersection at, intersections at each end, Williams Road to the west and Mango Road to the east, currently operate at acceptable levels of service and are anticipated to continue to operate at acceptable levels of service upon development of the subject project. Further, the traffic study concluded that development of the subject project is not anticipated to have material impacts upon traffic operating conditions in that changes to level of service, delay, et cetera, are estimated to be of a magnitude minor enough to not be perceptible to motorists. This is aided by the development developer funded left turn lane that will be constructed on Joe Ebert Road at the project site driveway, which will not only benefit the project, but will also benefit the other motorists using Joe Ebert Road. As the road will be reconstructed within the area of the turn lane and through the transition areas on each side of it, resulting in new construction for a distance of approximately 1,000 feet. 
Uh, this brings me to the condition of Joey Ebert Road, which was referenced in the staff report as being substandard, uh, where the term substandard was reiterated at the ZHM hearing by those in opposition, suggesting that the road is in poor physical shape and not capable of handling existing traffic loads, much less new traffic from the subject development. However, putting the, sub the term substandard into context provides important clarification. Joey Ebert Road is only substandard in comparison to the county's TS7 typical section for a collector roadway, which which uh, reflects 12-foot travel lanes, 5-foot five five paved shoulders, plus three additional feet of stabilized shoulders, 5-foot sidewalks on both sides, and a minimum right-of-way width of 96 feet. Uh, since Joey Road does not have these features, we met with a county engineer to discuss its characteristics, which do include 10 to 11-foot lanes, a continuous sidewalk on its south side, and a varying right-of-way width between 50 and 70 feet. From that discussion, an administrative variance was prepared to evaluate and document the features of Joey Ebert Road, including a safety analysis, which concluded that Joey Ebert Road does not have a safety issue. It's ad it adequately provides for pedestrian mobility and is otherwise satisfactory, as evidenced by the county engineer's approval of the administrative variance on December 20th of 2019. And of course, I'll be here for questions and follow up. Thank you. You have one minute and 12 seconds left. In conclusion, this request is to receive full compliance with the county's comprehensive plan and the land development code. Based on the reference submitted documentation, I respectfully request your approval of this application. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have this uh, one person of record to speak in opposition, David Trimble. Morning, so you have 10 minutes. My name is David Trumbo. I live at 9714 um, Sorbonne Loop Road in the Toulon subdivision. Sorry. Um, all that was interesting. Um, as far as Joe Ebert Road is, it's a two lane road. It has cracks all the way through it, has potholes. It's been substandard in terms of the, the way we talk about it for many years. Excuse yes. me, uh, Mr. Trimble, I, I need to remind you at this time that uh, as you present your testimony, uh, you're going to need to remain um, on the record of what you presented or others presented during the zoning hearing master hearing or any um, documentation that was placed into the record well, prior was, to the zoning hearing master hearing. That was one of the things I talked about was the substandard nature of the road. And they in their testimony said it was substandard, then later came back and said it's not a substandard road. So I just wanted to clarify in terms of what we consider substandard or, or standard. It's not, a, it's not a very nice road. It's, it's got lots of potholes, got lots of things that need to be corrected. Um, it's a two lane road. So it's in terms of that, that's what we thought substandard meant. So I just wanted to clarify that in terms of, of what my opposition is at the community development meeting, the petitioner um, represented that there was not any opposition to it. And my understanding from talking with residents in our, our community is there were um, problems with that. Um, our problem is, is we're in a planned community and all the other, sub all the other subdivisions in our area are meeting the zoning that's currently there. And we don't feel that there's a need to increase the density when there's two small two lane roads um, around the property. Um, so from the perspective of the road, that's, that's why I brought that up. Um, in terms of the, the not having any problems with, with this development being developed, our community did. We all live in an area that's very um, rural. All of our properties are, are larger than the average across the county. This is on the edge of the county, and I realize it's different. Um, many people moved there because they didn't want to live in many of the subdivisions, like a fishhawk, where there's a lot of traffic and things like that. So from our community standpoint, we're just asking that they continue to use the same zoning that was originally established. Does that fit within that? I'm sorry. <laughs> you can continue. Just uh, please stay on the record. You're okay. doing fine now. <laughs> okay. Um, 
so in terms of, of developing that road, that wasn't brought to our attention at the hearing either as far as making a turn lane. That was a concern of ours. Um, so I don't know where that sits other than what I just heard at this point. Um, however, if you live in a subdivision and you're used to that subdivision and, you, and we have many people that moved in wanting this zoning, we don't need, think we need a, a change in the zoning. We think it can be built the same way, the density, the same as all the rest of the neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Rebuttal, applicant, you have five minutes. For the record, uh, Timothy H. Powell, um, TSB Companies, Post Office Box 1016, Tampa, Florida, 33601. Uh, simply reiterate uh, Mike Razor's earlier testimony that the roadway went under extensive review and analysis, and it has been deemed safe. Um, as to the request to simply keep the zoning um, as it is, uh, that's why we took it, um, extreme measures to meet with the citizens. Um, back in September, we met with Planning uh, Commission staff and Development Services staff uh, extensively and achieved approvals across the board. Um, so therefore, we feel that the zoning is appropriate. At this time, I'll turn it over to um, David. Mr. Folsom is a property owner and he spoke at the zoning hearing master, so I'd like to invite him up to make a statement, please. Um. Who is this? I'm sorry, he, he is not, uh, Mr. Folsom is not an um, oral argument speaker. Uh, either it needs to be um, someone for the applicant team or um, someone who's on oral argument list. He, he's a property owner, a, a part of the application, and he, he did speak at this he, Is he the property owner for the subject property yes. that's authorized you as the applicant? That's correct. Okay, then he can proceed. Thank you. My name is Tom Folsom. I live at 10201 Tom Folsom Road. I've lived there all my life and I've had seven different addresses. They talk about the area not being rural. It used to be rural. All of the roads out there were dirt. The county started paving, the, not paving, but grading the roads. And as progress went on, they paved all of the roads. We actually deeded hundreds of feet of Tom Folsom Road to the county. The piece of property that's in question, we still pay taxes to the center of Joe Ebert Road. The biggest reason that all of this was in, in, in orange groves, both sides of the road, Tom Folsom, including on the other side of Harney Road. All of Joe Ebert had groves all the way down to County Road of Mango, Road 579. As time went on, they put the water through, they put the sidewalk through. The county actually gave us a letter of release of liability on the property, and they went ahead as a civic duty. We signed, and the, the water and the sidewalks were put in place. So what I would like to show you all and explain, agriculture is a thing of the past in Finota Sassa. These are all case numbers from the sheriff's department. Various crimes was committed, whether it be stolen or pure vandalism, we have never been any retribution for it. The other thing is, if you go to your insurance company and you turn in three or four claims, you get a letter immediately telling you that you're going to be dropped. So agriculture in that area, everybody says that it is rural. It is not rural. As they said, Toulon is to the, the west side of the property south side bloomfield is all the way to county road 579 on the other side just this very year in january and february we had vandalism thefts on kingsway inside of lake the Sassa. we literally had our fences cut i'm four sorry sir uh, even uh, as the applicant and the owner of the property, uh, you still need to stick to the record of the zoning hearing master. Okay. So uh, please, what you talked about at, at the zoning hearing master hearing is fine to talk about, but uh, any other facts or incidences um, can't be brought in at this time. Okay. I, I will just 
informing you that the area is not rural as everyone considers it to be and the issues of trying to do agriculture out there it certainly isn't the highest and best use of the land to keep it in agriculture and that's the reason uh, the problems we're having that we're asking for the zoning change thank you the applicant you still have one minute and 27 seconds and that's all we have thank you okay, thank you uh, planning commission Thank you, Melissa Leinhardt, Planning Commission staff. The subject property is located within the residential for future land use category. It is in the urban service area and within the limits of the Fenona Sassa community plan. The applicant is requesting a planned development for the purpose of developing a maximum of 133 single family residential units. The site is within the urban service area and is subject to future land use element minimum density policies. The immediate area is a combination of agricultural and low density residential future land use designations. With an acreage of 36.04, the site can be considered for up to 144 <coughs> residential units. Though the applicant is not maximizing the units that can be considered, the applicant is still meeting minimum density requirements per policy 1.2 of the future land use element. Allowing sites flexibility to develop at or above the minimum density policy assists the county in reaching a greater utilization of land within the urban service area. The subject property is on the edge of the urban service area and the proposed application would allow single family detached residential lots at a minimum of 6,000 square feet. However, to minimize impacts to the lower density de developments to the east, the proposed lot sizes are 8,400 square feet. Additionally, buffering and screening above code requirements are being utilized to mitigate any impacts to the surrounding rural larger residential lots that are external to the site which is consistent with several policies in the community design component. Comprehensive plan policies both encourage diversity of lot sizes and mitigation of lots and new developments that are adjacent to lower density uses. The adopted definition of compatibility indicates it does not mean the same as, rather it refers to the sensitivity of development proposals and maintaining the character of the existing development. The overall area contains mostly single family residential development and a planned development rezoning with single family residential lots is compatible with the existing development pattern. The site is located within the Fenota Sasso community plan and this request is meeting the intent of that plan by maintaining the existing diversity of housing types and styles. Based upon those considerations, Planning Commission staff finds the proposed plan development consistent with the future of Hillsborough Comprehensive Plan for unincorporated Hillsborough County, subject to the conditions proposed by Development Services. Thank you. Zoning Hearing Master. The Zoning Hearing Master considered the applicant's request for a rezoning of a approximately 36-acre property located approximately on the south side of Joe Ebert Road near Timmins Road. The application requests to rezone the property from RSC2 restricted, RSC2 and AR to a planned development for a maximum of 133 single family residential units. The property is wholly located within the urban service area along the, although, excuse me, the rural service area exists immediately north across Joe Ebert Road and immediately adjacent and east on property developed as the Bloomfield Hills subdivision. The zoning hearing master found that the proposed application would allow single family detached residential lots at a minimum of 6,000 square feet. However, to minimize impacts to the lower density to the east, the proposed lot sizes are, there are um, approximately 8,400 square feet. Additionally, buffering and screening above code requirements are being utilized to, mit to mitigate any impacts to the surrounding lar rural larger residential lots which are external to the site, consistent with policy 12, 1.1 of the future land use element. The zoning hearing master considered opposition concerns with regard to Joe Ebert Road and uh, crash analysis that was provided by the applicant uh, found that Joe Ebert Road does not have a safety issue associated with roadway characteristics. The zoning hearing master found that regarding compatibility, buffering and screening above code requirements are being utilized to mitigate any impacts to the surrounding rural and larger residential lots external to the site consistent with policy 12.1.1. The zoning hearing master found that the applicant is not maximizing the units that can be considered, but the request is still meeting minimum <coughs> density requirements as per policy 1.2 of the future land use element. 
the zoning hearing master therefore recommended approval of the plan development rezoning. Thank you. Mr. Merman, you recognize. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I will move approval of this item. I want to thank everybody. Is there a second? Is there a second? Second. Uh, I want to thank everybody for coming out to speak on this item, especially the property owner. I uh, have full, full respect for you and the rights um, of your property. Um, I did uh, ask Adam Gormley, though, um, order to pass this, that there would be a condition uh, put on to pave the road. And, uh, if I can ask Adam to uh, present that condition. Yeah. Commissioner, thank you. The, the condition, and I've discussed it with the applicant's rep representative, would read that the developer shall repave Joe Ebert Road from the eastern project boundary to the terminus of the westbound left turn lane transition, which will take it a little bit past the western boundary of, of the project. So it'll be the project frontage plus the, the, the transition for the left turn lane. Okay, so my, um, my motion to approve would include that condition. Mr. Thank Oldman, you, you recognize. Um, I was going to ask a similar type of condition because, you know, we're putting a lot more people here. Um, our, our plan, comprehensive plan, permits below average service conditions to on transportation requirements, and then we're asking for a waiver. So um, I was quite challenged by that concept. It may not necessarily have the load of service on it now, but we're adding a lot more homes to it. We're starting to see development in that area. It's right on the edge of the urban service area. And there's no sidewalks, and so uh, except for on one side, if I'm not mistaken. So resurfacing will make the road better, but does I, I can't determine whether the waiver you know, takes away walking along that road safely at night an option. I'm, I'm having difficulty finding that language in here. Yes. Commissioner, the, the, the condition will require that the, with the road uh, be repaved so the conditions that were described would be, would be Two right, lane rural fresh, road. Correct. That's the challenge here. We're in an urban area, but it's currently a two lane rural road. So, but we're planning and we're inside the urban service area or right on the edge of it, but we're not requiring urban service area type of road design. That's correct. The, the road, I believe, is, is, is <laughs> okay, currently. You understand my question yes, here. Is, is and yet we're asking for a waiver too. So I'm like, how, please, please come forward, sir. I, I would appreciate this. No. My challenge is we continue to do this and then have communities harm people or have people get harmed in communities that we build and without necessarily building roads along the way that allow for safe other than car travel. I'm and I think that's the key here being is that you're inside the urban service area I'm trying to just find what does unreasonable cost mean I, or unreasonable burden. How does that define? David Wright, again, uh, there will be sidewalk on the project's uh, side of the road. There's not sufficient right of way to put sidewalk on both sides. So that was part of the waiver is that allowing the sidewalk on one side of the road. Okay. So the property owner indicated that he had owned the land pretty much down the middle of Joe Ebert Road. So that's a, a manageable uh, process of adding the sidewalks alongside uh, along the south side of Joe Road. Side. Yes. Okay. Along the property line. Correct. Yes. Basically. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's what I was wanting to make sure was going to happen because again, we keep allowing level of service D to exist. This is C because we don't have volume, but we're right on the verge of having volume in that area. Um, and cumulatively, if we're still inside the urban service area, we need to make sure we're planning for urban development and, um, and design roads and require roads that meet that kind, of, that kind of traffic. So thank you for your answer. Okay, we have a motion by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner White with conditions of paving the road by the applicant. Seeing no further discussion, please record your vote. Motion carried, seven to zero. Thank you. Mr. Moretta. Thank you, commissioners. This brings us up to the related items, uh, public hearings. 
first related item is H1A and H1B. This is a personal appearance in South Bend. Um, the, the proposed modification to the plan development for this site is uh, modifying internal roadways and alignments, development and parcel configurations, um, in addition to uh, school site uh, revising acreages with respect to the various parcels planned for school sites, and also the correction to the DRI to reflect the proposed changes in H1A. Um, H1B is the DRI, DRI item 20-0005, and it will have the requisite uh, revisions in the, in the development order uh, if approved by the board in H1A. Uh, Mr. Israel Monsanto is going to walk the board through the various changes that are proposed to the site plan. Good morning, Israel Monsanto Development Services. Commissioners, to your left, you have the current PD plan. This is only the southernmost portion of the PD. You can see the, how the road alignments are laid at uh, Covington uh, Garden and Watershed Boulevard, Road A and 30th Street. The proposed changes, as you can see, uh, we have um, highlighted them in different colors. The red color is the school site. Uh, one of the school sites um, is 25 acres because of the road realignment is now 15 acres. The blue area is Covington Garden Drive. It's being moved uh, to the east yes, along the I-75. Yellow color is the Watershed Boulevard. Uh, this, is, this boulevard is being straightened it out, so you can see now it's more straight. Um, Road. Purple is Road A. Currently, Road A would go from the western boundary all the way to 30th Street. The applicant is proposing to end Road 8 at Waterset, and then Covington Garden will keep going and then connect to 30th Street Avenue on a northern uh, point. And finally, 30th Street is being slightly reconfigured, and this um, new layout out will be modifying track 24 on two tracks, track 24A and track 24B. All all conditions are being amended to reflect all these changes. If I have any questions you have available. Thank you. You have a question again? Commissioner Smith, you recognize. I think so. Um, I was having a heart. The uh, South Coast Greenway Trail comes through here, and the developer is required to build that. And uh, I think it, I, I'm just having a hard time finding uh, that and making sure that it is still here and the developer is still required to, to build it. So that trail is currently shown on the west side of Waterset mm -hmm. and then goes on the west side of 30th Street. You, you can, maybe you cannot see it in this specific graphic where it's still there and still we require. Thank you. Okay, applicant, you have 15 minutes. Elise Batzel with Stearns Weaver, 401 East Jackson Street. I'm here with Tim Plate from Height Design. Uh, we're available to answer any questions that you may have today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. There's no party of record uh, uh, on this particular issue. Can we vote on both of these at the same time? Yes, sir. Yes, Commissioner, and it is a public hearing. Well, you have to have party of the record? Uh, there is a public hearing. I would ask you. I say, do you have to have parties of record for a public hearing? Oh no, sir. This is an open public hearing. It's a PRS minor modification right. with a related DRI. Any, anyone wish to speak as a proponent? Anyone wish to speak as a proponent? Anyone wishing to speak as an opponent? Anyone wish to speak as an opponent? Seeing none, what's your pleasure? Mm -hmm. Motion by Commissioner Merman, second, second by Commissioner White to approve item A1 and A H one A and H two. Wait a minute, H one A and H one B. See the further discussion, please record the vote. Motion carried, seven to zero. Mr. Moretta. Thank you, commissioners. This brings us up to item H2A and H2B on the agenda. H2A is a proposed rezoning to plan development, 19-1445. H2B is a related item agreement for a colonnade cross town for a mobility fee buy-down incentive program. Commissioners, the, the plan development is located on the Northwest intersection of Causeway Boulevard and US 301. Um, the proposal is going from several zoning districts essentially to a planned development to allow three different parcelizations uh, with uh, respective development. Along Causeway, we have parcels B and C. Uh, those, those units are proposing for 45,000 square feet of retail and hotel 
Um, parcel C is proposing 425,000 square feet of retail hotels as well. And parcel A, which is to the north of the, the site, is proposing approximately 1,400,000 square feet of manufacturing distribution. Staff is recommending approval with conditions, and staff is also recommending an additional condition to this item, item H2A, uh, to recognize a vacate as necessary. And I'll read the condition into the record. It says approval of this plan development shall be effective upon approval of vacating petition V20-0011 by the Hillsborough County Board of Commissioners. That particular vacating will be coming to the board at a, at a future um, land use meeting. Um, staff is recommending approval of the zoning item. Uh, that particular rezoning would be on consent. However, the applicant has filed oral argument to speak to the board, and then there'll be a subsequent discussion on the buy down incentive program agreement. Um, again, staff is recommending approval of the zoning. Um, we're so available for questions. We're gonna vote on this separately. Uh, you may vote on both together. Uh, oral argument has been filed, so okay. you'll need to open for oral argument for the presentation by the applicant. Okay, all right. Before we open for oral argument, we'll take the chairman's prerogative. Mr. Marchetti, come to the podium, please. It is so good to see you, my man. Thank you. We are, we've been praying for you and uh, hoping that you will return, and the Lord has answered prayer. Thank you very much. So That's why I'm here, because the prayers. We want to be glad to support. say that you're here, and, and we continue to pray for you. Thank you. Okay. Very much. Thank you. I have a motion to open for oral argument. Motion Thank by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner White to open for oral arguments. Any further discussion, please record your vote. Motion carried, seven to zero. Applicant. Thank you for that, Mr. Chairman. Jake Kramer with Stearns Weaver Miller, 401 East Jackson Street. Uh, commissioners, the only reason we filed oral, oral argument today is to answer any questions you had since there was a related item. Otherwise, we would have been on consent. Uh, we're here to uh, uh, keep Coke Florida, uh, one of the largest independent bottlers in the country, uh, in, in this county. They're looking at a over $300 million, $300 million investment uh, in the county and they're looking to create 182 new jobs in, in the county. Uh, this is a great opportunity. Uh, this is just the sort of redevelopment I think this board has been looking for. So we're here with any questions. We have representatives of the developer as well as Coke Florida and our entire team. So we ask for your approval and we would ask for you to vote on these items at the same time. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I have no one uh, in opposition or party of record at this particular point in time. This is in my district. It is bringing jobs in my district. I'm going to pass the gavel to the vice chair and move that we approve item H2A and H2B. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple of quick uh, comments uh, regarding H2B. Um, this is an extremely uh, valuable targeted, and I want to emphasize targeted, uh, economic development tool uh, that has greatly assisted our economic development efforts. Uh, we've approved several mobility fee buy-down uh, incentives since the board approved the program in 2016. Uh, however, with headquarters, manufacturing, and a distribution uh, component, this is by far the biggest project we've considered under this program. And unless I'm mistaken, uh, this is a bigger project than Amazon. If, unless I'm mistaken. Uh, it's an excellent ROI. Property currently generates $33,000 in uh, property tax revenue, uh, but this project will generate over $1.3 in unincorporated Hillsboro uh, alone per year. Our, our investment will, will be repaid in less than four years, which is virtually unheard of in our economic development uh, or incentive tools. So, uh, and lastly, this location uh, in Commissioner uh, Miller's district, but it's uh, identified as one of our competitive sites and is in a Palm River redevelopment area. So it's an ideal location for this type of development. And I'm, I'm very pleased to support the, the motion. Excellent. Uh, Commissioner Murray, you recognize um, Thank you. And uh, like Commissioner Hagan has said, uh, I feel this is such a huge win and boost for Hillsborough County. Um, you know, it's just the jobs that are being created. That's what I look at. And the fact that this is going into one of the identified nodes, like Commissioner Hagan said, in our redevelopment areas, it's 
uh, close to a transportation grid, it's, um, you know, it, the ad valorem that is, the increase is like unbelievable, uh, the difference, but I'm really happy about the jobs and all the people that live in the apartments and the surrounding areas, and now they can really have access to good paying jobs. And uh, I think that's what our job here is, is to make sure that our citizens have uh, every single opportunity um, to really have gainful employment. But I really do want to thank uh, the folks from Coca-Cola. They have been outstanding partners through this, very patient. And um, you just can't wait to see the fruits of the labor as this really progresses. So thank you all very much. Okay, Commissioner Smith, you're recognized. Thank you, and I like everything about this project. Um, it, it's, I'm just balking at the huge um, incentive from, uh, from the county. It's by far the largest buy down of mobility fees ever proposed since the program began. We haven't had anything uh, close to a million yet, and this is five million, um, including a 15% a contingency that is 630,000, which is the size of you know one of our some of our larger buy downs. And um, I'm hoping to raise mobility fees to help pay for transportation improvements as we grow, and we may soon be asking taxpayers to reconfirm their recent vote for sales tax to pay for transportation and giving away $5 million to a big corporation is just a bridge too far for me. I'm, I'm happy with everything else about this project, but I can't support that um, incentive. Sorry. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, actually, I'm listening to um, Commissioner Smith's comments. I'm just trying to um, I, I also think it's great. I mean, I want to see 182 new jobs. I want to see this. I felt like we were given too little information. I had asked yesterday about what the um, uh, return was ad valorem, and I just heard it this morning. Uh, they, that information wasn't available to me yesterday afternoon. So I think it would be um, good for us to um, kind of understand and get the economics of this down um, uh, in a more thorough way um, sometime earlier, because I did have um, quite a few questions that I still, as of yesterday, couldn't uh, get answered. Uh, so I would like to, to understand that better. Also, um, and also just to generally understand uh, what we're, I don't know, are we doing, uh, and can anyone answer this? I'm just uh, curious. Are, so are we doing any ad valorem tax as far as countywide goes, um, credit or, um, Waiver. Is there anyone that can? Excuse me, Cal, can we ask um, Mr. Martin to come forward and, and elaborate, which is basically what's covered in H2B? Good morning, Commissioners. Ron Barton, Assistant County Administrator for Economic Prosperity. Uh, the specific question, no, ma'am, there are no uh, property tax waivers or exemptions associated with this thank you because in since uh, i'm i'm thinking that that might and i also i just worry about the um and i'm going to support this um uh, but the you know what um when we do a waiver i'm um, i'm worried about waiving the uh our our road our infrastructure at, in particular, mm -hmm. um, because it is um, in such, I, I feel, such neglected and um, difficult uh, place that uh, we find ourselves in. So I'll, I'll be supporting this, but I just would like to, uh, I'm very pleased to have this project. I think it's great work and thank, thank you. And I think, um, you know, uh, I, I welcome this. Um, I just think in that we're just gonna have to keep <laughs> looking at what we can do in terms of our, our infrastructure needs that are so significant uh, in the future. So hopefully we can uh, make this up ad valorem or, or otherwise to, so that we can meet these needs, these critical needs that um, I think are so suffering. Okay, does the applicant have any further presentation they'd like to make? 
Jay Kramer, no ma'am, no more further presentation unless you have any more questions. Thank okay. You. So we have a motion to approve uh, HB, H2A and H2B. Um, record your vote. Both items. Motion carried six to one. Commissioner Smith voted no. Thank you. This brings us to staff items K1. Mr. Adam Gorman is going to make this presentation. Commissioners, item K1 is uh, in response to the board's request at the last uh, land use meeting to uh, have a discussion about the items that would go on the land use consent agenda. Uh, item K1 has a brief description of uh, the criteria that have been established and essentially they are items that has no, no public hearing required. An item has consistent recommendations, whether approval or denial, and there's no oral argument filed. So the items that would go on regular would be those that don't meet those criteria, items with public hearings, items with uh, inconsistent recommendations between Development Services, Planning Commission, and the Zoning Hearing Master, or oral argument having been filed. And so that, that's the criteria we have. We're open to any uh, discussion or direction the board would like to have or give on, on on how those items might appear on, on future land use agendas. Thank you, Mr. Gorman. Commissioner Obama, you recognize? Uh, thank you. I was going to bring this up in future discussion items, but it relates to this particular issue. Um, earlier today, we approved a mixed, mixed use development consisting of multifamily units in addition to commercial and office uses. I'm, I like that. Uh, because the applicant was proposing a mixed-use development, they were able to request a density bonus, which is great, and we were able to see these types of investment at every land use, use meeting. However, it's my understanding that only one density bonus is permissible per development, and thus developers are not able to further utilize a density bonus for a project such as affordable housing. Um, I'm a firm believer that multi-use affordable housing are not mutually exclusive. They're actually complementary. And if you add a robust transit you, to the mix, you actually have a perfect recipe for success in what we've been discussing about our con not only our comprehensive plan and our community development goals. So I bring this item up as an example of how we could fully entice this and future developers to build affordable housing if we had more tools in our toolbox. And because these immediately go to consent before we ever have that discussion, I'm gonna ask uh, staff to develop and bring back to the board for review a comprehensive affordable housing strategy as it relates to zoning and the load, loan, uh, land development code to foster and incentivize affordable housing development, including but not limited to the ability to stack density bonuses, parking waivers, expedited approval, and fee waivers. Because those, all those decisions fly through consent frequently, and we miss an opportunity to negotiate an op opportunity for affordable housing in some way, shape, or form with the appropriate carrots. If we've already given them all away, how do we get what we're looking for? So. Is that a motion? Yeah. Well, it was a request for staff, but I'll make it a motion. Is there a second? Second. Let me ask a question. So are you asking that those, what you just described, not, it will not be on consent agenda any longer? Is that what you requested? No, I believe it can probably go to consent, but it needs to be specifically, it has to get ahead of the process, because if it's already gone through the process and it's not considered we don't have a policy of being able to double up on the density bonus. If it's already offered for some other reason, like we want de more density there, then we don't have the ability to add additional incentives when it comes to density, given that our legislature offers that as our only tool. If we don't have the ability to double it up, I'd like to find out what, we, what kind of strategy we could actually put forth. Okay. Yes, ma'am. 
Hi, I'm Melissa Leinhard, Planning Commission staff. I would um, respectfully ask that the motion be augmented to include comprehensive plan language. Mm -hmm. The density bonus does include is included in the comprehensive plan. So I think if we were to specify language in the code, we would need to have corresponding changes in the comprehensive plan. Thank you. I would like to offer that amendment to the to my motion, please. Uh, so that's an amendment that you're, you're bringing forth, am I correct? All right, so why don't you let someone else offer that amendment? Okay. Who would like to offer it? Commissioner Kemp? Commissioner Kemp offers amendment, is there a second? Second. Okay. okay. We're now on the amendment to the motion, the discussion on the amendment. Seeing the further discussion on the amendment, please record the vote. Motion carried seven to zero. Now we're back with the main motion, Commissioner Merman. Um, thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I just want to ask staff, uh, how is this going to work? I'm kind of, I, 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 there's too many questions around this. From your process and what you do in development services, how is this going to work? I, I would understand the motion that we, we look at. We currently offer several um, incentives for affordable housing some of them were in, in the land development code some of them were in the comprehensive plan uh, they do include density bonuses uh, in the in the land development code there are lot size incentives for affordable housing uh, projects I would understand this motion that we look at how those can be um, uh, augmented to to to, to provide further incentive to affordable housing, the, the density bonus, and the grid is it, it starts in the comprehensive plan, provides bonuses for projects to go over the allowed density intensity in a future land use map if they do certain things, one of them being mixed use development, the other being affordable housing, but they can't both, you cannot build right. two, two bonuses on top of each other. So right. take this motion to, to look at, at um, bringing back a proposal to allow those to be uh, stacked on one another and um, in, in, take the included language is to be, um, I, I'd suggest that we would be looking at our uh, criteria for density bonus in the land development code. It, it is currently um, the, the, the traditional 80% um, AMI standard and um, there, there are some things that we could look at in, a, in conjunction with affordable housing. May I have uh, another question? Yes. Um, okay, so how's this going to work with the applicants that are, whose items are on consent? I guess I'm just trying to understand. You're going to go through the items. You're going to figure out if there's a potential for a density bonus that can be offered um, for affordable housing. Uh, and, I, and I understood this motion to be sort of distinct from what goes on the consent agenda. So I think that I understood this, that, that there was an item on the consent agenda that, that spurred the interest in looking at these items. So this will be separate from, is that your understanding? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's all. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kepp, you recognize. That was my understanding too, that this was just prompted by this discussion of the consent agenda. Um, but apropos to this, which again, isn't about the consent agenda, but about this, which I think is a very good um, proposal. Um, because I've heard it said many times from this uh, dais in different conditions or a belief, I just would like to draw people's attention, uh, the uh, commissioner's attention to the 2019 uh, Florida statutes, again, on the impact fees. So just to be clear here, um, a county, municipality, or special district may provide an exception or waiver for an impact fee for the development or construction of housing that is affordable, as defined in 420. If a county, municipality, or special district provides such an exception or waiver, it is not required to use any revenues to offset the impact. So I just want to be uh, clear um, with regards to that, so there's clarity about that. Um, this section does not apply to water and sewer connection fees. Uh, so I have heard, I believe, heard that misstated or misunderstood. So I really wanted to, um, Florida statutes I'm reading from 2019, I just want to um, make sure that there's clarity about that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. See no further discussion. Please record your vote. 
Motion carried, seven to zero. Mr. Moretta, anything further? Commissioner Smith, you recognize. Thank you. Oh. Uh, thank you. Um, back on the consent agenda criteria that, that uh, staff was talking about, um, I would like to make some suggestions about that. One, that we do not have on consent any increase in density outside the urban service area. We've run into trouble with that. Um, a time or two <clears throat> since I've been here, and I think it would just be easier if we could evaluate those things not on consent. Increases in density outside the urban service area, increases in density on failed roads, um, or proposals that will push roads to level of service F, um, or with obvious negative downstream effects. In fact, that's part of um, the development services 12-month uh, um, land use work plan that we've just had brought forth to look at those downstream effects. So if those, um, anything with uh, design exceptions required, um, I think bears a, a discussion at the board level or where the schools are over capacity would be another um, another possibility of removing those things from consent to have board discussion. So those would be my suggestions. Okay. Commissioner Kempe recognized. Thank you. Um, I'd also, I don't think it would impact um, consent that much, but I've seen times when it would, uh, or, or removing a, a one item maybe or two, but I'm wondering about a limit um, under 10 acres. Um, it looks like today, uh, it would only, on the consent agenda, have uh, affected a few items, actually. It looks like two today. Um, and But in the past, I've seen some pretty dramatic items on consent. We seem to have moved a little bit away from that. Uh, but I'm thinking about something like anything over uh, 10 acres. OK. Anything else to come before us today? Two more people in the oh, sorry. Commissioner yes. Rowan, you recognize. Well, okay. I'm trying to understand. Um, if we pull everything off consent that would lead to a failed road, we're not even giving the applicant the opportunity to um, offer to fix the failed road or use the mobility fees that we're going to be increasing to do that. So why would we want, it sounds like we don't want anything on consent anymore. I mean, personally, I think um, we're kind of micromanaging staff in some ways. Um, I, I understand the one about outside the urban service area, because I think that's, but the failed road and the, um, potential for a failed road, I think it's just going a little too far. I, um, I, I think there needs to be a strong message, and if we use the checklist that we developed on every project that comes in, will, you know, the developer and all the applicant will see, you know, your, your project is not going to go very far because you've got you know, you've got to make improvements on the roads here. So, but, but if they make the improvements for the road and it's part of their application, you're saying you still want it pulled because it's on the failed road, yet they're offering to fix the road. So I guess well, I, I think Mr. there's Mayor, this, just- this is, this is what we're gonna do, okay? Um, Mr. Gorman told me the staff needs some direction. Uh, they had some suggestions, but no direction which means we need to put some of these in the form of a motion. Okay? So I'm going to go back to Commissioner Smith, since she, was, she brought up her suggestions first. And so Commissioner Smith, you need to put yours in the form of a motion, and this board will decide if we want to agree with you or not agree with you. Okay. Um, and, and I hear you, Commissioner Merman, Commissioner, that Commissioner. If, if the end result, the roads no longer failed anymore, that would, that would be fine. Um, so let me, let me put it this way uh, to, to get started with. Um, to not put on consent any increase in density outside the urban service area 
or any uh, proposals that will result, will, that will leave the roads in uh, uh, a level of service F um, at, the, you know, at the end of their, <coughs> the result of their project will be there, there will be no level of service F roads. And I'll leave it there and see if we can get this much passed and then see if we want to add anything else. Okay. That's a motion by Commissioner Smith, second by Commissioner Kemp. Is there a discussion on the motion? Commissioner Hagan, you recognize? Yeah, I want to say I completely agree with Commissioner Merman's uh, comments. And I guess the question I've got for, I guess, I don't know if it's Adam or Joe. Uh, the motion that's on the floor, do you feel that that's going to dramatically increase our regular agenda? Uh, commissioners, I, I believe that um, those increases in density outside the urban service area will not amount to a large number of, of, of items. Um, the, the issue of failed roadways um, is, or has moved from concurrency to mobility fees. We have a different mechanism for, uh, for addressing roadway capacity deficiencies. Uh, that may, there may be more items that are, that are uh, caught in that. Uh, that. That direction may implicate more items then increases in density outside the urban service area uh, simply because it's a different nature of how we're dealing with um, with failed roads going from concurrency to a mobility fee. So I'd say of those two, the, the roadway item would, would likely result in more items on regular than the density in the urban service area. Okay, I may be the only one up here, but I'm not interested in dramatically increasing our regular agenda. Our meetings drag on way too long as it is. And I'm going to be very honest, if we're going to go in that direction, then I think we should go back to having two land use meetings a month like we used to uh, when I first got on this board. Okay. Mr. White, to the motion. So for level of service of roads, it, it's, it, the starting point is the board's adopted level of service of that road, correct? That's correct. Right. Yes, we, we don't have any roads that have an adopted level of service of F, do we? No, sir. D or C are the D, adopted D or level C of service. D or C would be the adopted. Yes, okay. Commissioner Kemp to the motion. Thank you. Uh, I just think if, if, this, if uh, something like this would dramatically increase our agenda, um, then we have a problem. Um, so I think it's a really good uh, level of oversight and knowledge for this board to have. And I would hope that the kinds of things that um, would uh, come to our attention would be resolvable and not, you know, <laughs> hour long uh, back and forth. But I think it's a it's a good kind of oversight check. And uh, I would hope I, I would say if we dramatically increase the size of our agenda, then we have a real problem with what we're doing. If uh, if that blows our agenda out. Commissioner Smith, to your motion. Yes, one quick comment, just to, to point out, we do not do the applicants any favors by putting things on consent that we are all starting to pull off um, so they, they come not expecting, not prepared. I think it's better if we have some overarching uh, board direction uh, that, that guides staff in what they put on consent so that the applicant comes prepared to discuss those two things. Commissioner Mervins with a motion. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so based on Commissioner White's question to you about the failed roads, what does that mean in regards to her motion? I, I believe it would mean the implication being that roadways that would be on or would cause a, a roadway to go to level of service F or a level of service D in some circumstances, um, based on the motion, would be not on the consent agenda. Okay, so um, it could be a level of service road now of C or D. Yes. But that, not currently failed. A, a roadway, yes, it could be a level of service C or D, and with the development. Uh, um, trips, it would bring it to, a, to a, a failed or a D status, depending on where it is. Okay, I'm going to offer an amendment to the motion that the um, only way to pull it off consent would be if it's on a failed road. So have an amendment by Commissioner Berman, second by Commissioner Hagan. Second by Commissioner Hagan. 
Is there any discussion on the amendment to the motion? Any discussion on the amendment to the motion? See the discussion amendment. Commissioner Smith, you recognize. Sorry, but so so I was I was trying to get to where I thought you wanted to be, which is where if the development was going to leave it failed, we would pull it off consent. But um, because I had originally said if it's on a failed road, it would be off a, off of consent, and and that's where you're back to now. Can I answer yes. her question? Based on what Commissioner White asked of staff, it is if if there is something on consent where there is the level of service is like a well, be not an F, but it would be an F. If the development proceeded, mm -hmm. it would be off consent. Okay, then we're, that's what my original motion was, trying to get to what you wanted. I think it's too many items when you, based on what Commissioner White said, and my understanding of your motion is that any item um, that would lead to an F road, but I want the item to be, if it's not going to happen, but if it is on a failed road, it would be taken off consent. And I think I, from what I'm hearing is that you don't, you want it the other, you want it the way I don't want it. <laughs> okay. We have an amendment by Commissioner Merman, second by Commissioner Hagan. We're voting on the amendment. Please record your vote. Motion carried four to three. Commissioners Kemp, Overman, and Smith voted no. We're now back on the main motion. Is there any discussion on the main motion? Any discussion on the main motion? Seeing no further discussion, please record your vote. Motion carried seven to zero. I have one more. Commissioner Smith, and recognize. Uh, right, and so while we're talking about land development code, this is one simple land development code item that I've been working with staff on for a very, very long time uh, to try to simplify and streamline the, um, the way in which citizens participate in our zoning hearing. And um, we have finally come to one small uh, uh, but important step um, that I, they've told me I need board direction to uh, ask them to uh, draft um, a land development code amendment that would, they would bring back to us in the next cycle. So I'm just asking for uh, uh, board direction to let them draft an amendment to bring back. And what this addresses is uh, an issue that we've bumped into several times at the uh, these zoning hearings where we have people sometimes very, um, uh, very uh, involved community leaders who have gotten here expecting to be able to speak to their elected representatives and, and been tripped up by this one piece of red tape that is our request for oral argument form. And that's the last two pages of this document that I sent out, that I handed out to you. Um, and so what happens, and I don't know if, if you all uh, understand this, I've been through this many times as a, as a citizen, um, what happens is you go to the zoning hearing and, and then you have to wait. You can't just file this form that you find there. You have to wait 15 business days for the zoning hearing master to file his recommendations. And then you have a window of 10 calendar days where you fill out this two-page report. It's the last two, uh, or form, it's the last two pages of this uh, stuff you get at the zoning here. You've got this 10 calendar day window, and then there's about 18 more days till the county commission hearing. Well, you can't file it then. You can't file it the week before the county commission you have to fill out these two pages, the last two pages of this thing, 
15 business days after the zoning hearing, master hearing, within 10 calendar days, which ends up being 18, right. It's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, it, We haven't had a chance to read this. I know. I'm not asking you to read it. Um, it is, it is cumbersome to read. Um, and it, it, it turns out that you don't have to, it doesn't matter what you put on this. In fact, the applicant side and the citizen side, I've done this many times, fills out half a dozen of them for half a dozen people. You don't have to fill it out yourself. You don't have to sign it. You don't have to fill this form out if somebody else fills it out for you. But if you try to fill it out yourself, that last page really throws you. Uh, it looks really intimidating. What you want to do, you have to check one of these things. You have to fill in some uh, stuff in the lines below. If you, but the truth of the matter is, if you check anything except for number two about the evidence, and you say anything you want on the lines, you can say the same thing everybody else is saying. You get to speak at the Board of County Commission hearing if you filled it in. The point is that this is a mainly a piece of red tape that gets in the way. And let me tell you this, nobody else does this. We've looked at like 10 counties and cities uh, around here. Nobody is doing this um, uh, batch of, of red tape, not, um, not oh, Miami-Dade, Orange, Pasco, Pinellas, Pope, Manatee, or the city of, of Tampa. Nobody requires you to fill out this form before you can come speak to your elected representatives about a zoning hearing. So all I'm asking is board direction to allow staff to draft a land development code amendment that would just eliminate this one little piece of red tape and bring that back and then we can decide. And y'all can read it and you can decide if you still want them to have this or not, but just let's bring back a draft for the consideration of the board. And that's my motion. Second. I have a motion by Commissioner Smith, second by Commissioner Kemp. I'm gonna tell you now, I'm not gonna vote for this because I haven't had a chance to read this. Uh, we're making a drastic change to what's been going on in this county and I'm not comfortable sitting here voting for this and I haven't had a chance to review it at all. So I, I, that's a concern I have. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna support the motion until uh, the time maybe Maybe, maybe you want to have us look at this and bring it back in another meeting, but to vote on this today, to get, I mean, I don't, I don't feel comfortable with that. <laughs> Commissioner Merman, you recognize. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for saying that because I was going to recommend to make a, a substitute motion to defer this to a later meeting um, that where we can actually workshop the item and discuss it amongst each other and have time to review this um, and what other counties do. I mean, if we're gonna change our process, we need time to really look at what other people are doing and, and put the right information. So um, that's my, I'm making a substitute motion to defer this to a later meeting uh, where staff can make a more thorough presentation um, on the item. We have a substitute motion by Commissioner Merman. Is there a second? I'll second it. Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, and Commissioner Smith, as I understand, this is our code as we have it now. This isn't a suggestion for a new code. You're asking our staff to look at what other counties are doing. I've known for many years, um, though not as involved or uh, knowledgeable as you are, um, that it has been a huge barrier and, and we are an outlier, a huge outlier in how we discourage and um, convolute um, citizen um, abilities to speak to us by having this crazy cumbersome process that no one else has. I had looked into this originally because I'd heard so many complaints about it. Um, and I looked at what some other counties were doing myself, and no one had 
where you have to, if you speak at the zoning hearing master, and just so the board understands this a little bit, as it now stands, you can speak to the zoning hearing master, but then you have to wait till the zoning hearing master issues a decision, and then you have to re-sign up to speak at the board. That is utterly nowhere else. And then it's a window of, what did you say, 10 days or something like that after the zoning hearing master. So you have to wait as a citizen to wait for the zoning hearing master decision. Then you have to sign up in the 10 days following that. Then you can't sign up for the 18 days after that or however it goes. It is a um, huge barrier. If we did this for voting, no one would ever be voting. <laughs> um, and I really think that our uh, citizens deserve a streamlining. This isn't saying what that streamlining should be. This isn't saying uh, anything about, this is simply letting us um, look at as it now stands. And I know, I understand what you're saying is, I'd like to look at what some other counties are doing and could staff please look at that and um, come back with some suggestions and we could have a discussion uh, about it at that time, which I think is um, really where we uh, need to start being. So uh, it just, you know, it, it's, I, you, I understand you're trying to educate us about what it, how it is now and I'd like the opportunity um, to really review this and um, I, I'm just, just saying for the staff to look at alternatives to the cumbersome and uh, difficult process that we now have in place. And I appreciate the fact that you've worked on this and thought about it a lot and um, brought this forward. Mr. Uh, I, I was, was in the queue, but I, and really what I was just gonna say is this is what we give citizens. Right to understand our process. And, and early on, I had always said, you know, our job is to deliver well-rounded, efficient services to our citizen as best we can. This is not customer friendly, and I think is to Commissioner Smith's point. So taking the opportunity to take a look at it and find out if there's a better way to allow citizens and uh, investors and property owners to effectively get where they want to go is, is, worth, is a worthy effort. Um, if we can simplify it or streamfly, streamline it in such a way, which I think that's what your, what your motion is, is to do that. This is, uh, the, our review of this document is what we give citizens every day when they're in a party of record in any case that comes before this board. So while I may not have read it recently, it's a standard document. It's not a proposal that you're making. So I just want to clarify that. Um, Commissioner Smith, you're recognized. Right, so um, I had been working with staff on this and this is, the pro my motion was to have staff bring us a draft, Land Development Code Amendment, that would simply eliminate the form part from the process. It's not a major change. I do think we need to look at the whole process and compare it with other counties because, man, it is a Byzantine maze of red tape compared to what other counties do, and it all needs a look. But this proposal is a very simple uh, request to have staff draft something that would bring back, we could all have a chance to read it on the next Land Development Code uh, meeting where we're looking at that, to just see if we can eliminate this one form that nobody else requires that um, is such a, a, a cumbersome hurdle for citizens between the zoning hearing and us. We've run into this with the, the, the chair of the Balm Civic Association with a community activist who's been involved in the Waimama Community Plan coming here and finding themselves tripping up because they hadn't filled out this form within that window. And it's, it's really, and as I say, the, it doesn't matter how you fill it out. It doesn't, you don't have to sign it. Anybody can fill it out for you. It doesn't matter what you check or what you write on here. It's nothing but a piece of red tape. And so 
I was hoping we could just have that come here as a draft and that would give everybody a chance to think about it and look into that one small tweak to our, to our processes. Um, you know, if, it, so I'm gonna stick with that. But if, if we end up, you know, coming back for a, um, some other workshop. kind of, uh, like a workshop, mm -hmm. when would that be? I mean, what, do, I think, can I you think tell me Mr. the Mr. Gormley would yes. like to actually yes, assist us in Thank this you. process. Can you so, tell me yes. the difference between <laughs> these two? Thank you, Commissioner. So uh, the, our land development code amendment for round one is already underway. If the board uh, were to direct us to draft this amendment and for, for consideration and discussion at the uh, April 7th land use meeting, it will not be able to fit into this current round of amendments. We will have a workshop uh, at that date on, round, on amendments that are in that round, uh, depending on the board's uh, preference and direction. It could become its own round and, and lag a little bit behind the rest of the schedule or go to round two. So depend, as I understand the direction, it's to draft something for the board to consider as opposed to drafting something and including it in the round of amendments that, that will go forward. If that's, if that's the board's direction, we understand what, what it is, it's, it's taking the oral argument out of the process. Uh, the other item that will, that will implicate and, and for would need some additional direction is then what is the criteria of what goes on the consent agenda? Because without oral argument, the current criteria uh, don't, it, it, they would not fit that, that new scenario. So that is something else that, that could be part of the board's discussion if you so choose. Okay, great. Commissioner White, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Merman, um, I can understand the spirit of your substitute motion. Um, Commissioner Smith, this um, probably should have come on the agenda as a commissioner item on the commissioner section of the agenda. I know I would have liked to have seen it that way. Uh, however, um, I'm not going to be able to support the substitute motion. I, I will be supporting uh, your original motion. Um, it's probably no surprise that the District 4 Commissioner, um, you know, really feels the, the heat and the brunt of these issues um, literally on a daily basis because <laughs> most of the intensive growth is, is going on in my district. So um, I... I, I this is something, frankly, that I've been looking at myself, I, I'm, but I'm fine that you beat me to the punch on it here because it's important. Um, there is some red tape there. There are some barriers to entry, and, and frankly, I think we um, probably have more work to do in the land development code because I feel that we have several provisions uh, that benefit those that are able to, uh, to bring sophisticated legal teams to the table and things like that. I actually got to know the Bomb Civic Association folks really well because they showed up at a BOCC meeting not only because of this, this um, request for oral argument provision, but their item had actually ended up on the consent agenda. They were, they were lost just with the complete ZHM process from start to finish. And uh, my staff and I were able to you know, help bring them up to speed on some of these provisions and get them plugged in and, and active. So, so I'm feeling your, your pain here, uh, which is why I want to support it and, and get it moving um, sooner than later. Um, Madam uh, Chair, if, um, or Vice Chair, serving as Chair this very moment, um, if, uh, if the substitute motion fails and we get back to the main motion, I'd like to be recognized for an amendment. Excellent. Thank you. So we have a substitute Amen. motion. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't see. Commissioner Merman, yeah, you're recognized. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm counting votes here, so I'm gonna withdraw the substitute. Okay. So the substitute amendment has been withdrawn. Commissioner White. Thank you. I, I'd like to offer an amendment that um, that this be um, that it's um, that it become its own round. That it be inserted in its own round. Yeah, I have a motion by Commissioner. A substitute okay. amendment by Commissioner uh, White, second by Commissioner Kemp. Could you explain what you mean by own round? Uh, Mr. Gormley was explaining how it's too late to, um, uh, to have this uh, plugged in or inserted into round one 
So our months. options would be to wait for round mm -hmm. two, which would take some time, or it could just become its own round and travel on its own just slightly behind mm -hmm. what's what's currently in, in round one. More discussion. Yeah, sir, if, if there was desire to have more discussion, it, it wouldn't fit into the round. If the direction was today to go with it, then we could fit it into the round. But to your point, it will, it will accommodate a, 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 the different schedule to allow discussion to occur next month. Oh, you can you can get it into round one? If we if you gave direction today to go with it, as okay. opposed to having a board discussion on it. I'm gonna withdraw that motion then, okay. But just, for, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, if I'm not unclear, the, the direction I um, understand here is to bring it back for discussion at the next land use meeting. And if we do that, it will not be able to fit into the round. If the board were to, to say, go forward with the amendment and start it today, that, that process would start and notices would go out before the board would get a chance to discuss it again. So I'd if- I'd like to hear the main motion again. So- It's own. Uh, if we, repeat, if we repeat, want- Just repeat your motion. Yeah, the motion is was to have staff draft a land development code amendment that would do this and, and put it into this cycle that's coming forward. I'm not opposed to having more board discussion if, uh, if that's what needs to happen in order for everybody to feel more comfortable about this and understand the ramifications. But I, I just thought it was simple enough to, and, and that's, the, that's the advice I had gotten from staff over several months was to bring this uh, this way. You okay now? Just to, to clarify, I understood the motion that I heard today was to bring it back for the board to, to, to d discuss and consider it. If that's the desire, it will not fit in round one. If the motion today is go forward, draft it, and file it as an amendment, because you understand what, what the direction is, is to remove oral argument, then it can fit in round one. It will be a workshop at your next land use meeting, and it will, it will get distributed with our other land development code amendments that will be in this round. And so that's, that's the distinction. It's what the maker of the motion yeah. wants. Did, Mr. Madam Chair, do I? Okay. I'm, I'm chair. <laughs> okay, you're back as chair, Mr. Chairman. So, Commissioner Smith, just so that I understand the main motion then, are, are you asking for it to be inserted in round one? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And it'll, it'll, it'll come drafted part of round one. The board can certainly have discussion and vote it up or down then at that time, yeah. right? So, all right, so there's no need for, a, for, a, uh, for an amendment then. Okay. Concer concerning this whole idea, I'm gonna vote for it now because Commissioner White clarified everything on this okay however I would request that you don't bring these kind of things into the board meeting just clearly throwing on us I would advise in some way somehow this probably needs to be on the agenda so we can get it in advance so we can review it and then have a discussion on it just to spring it on us at this meeting regardless of what's in here it's, if, it's, if it's if it's something presently on here but you want to change I would suggest that you to put it on the, on the agenda as a members issue and then we have an opportunity to review it and then come in here and discuss it. But just to spring it on us, I don't feel comf didn't feel comfortable doing that. But I want to vote for it this time. In collegiality, I want to vote for it, and we bring it back and, and see what happens from there. But just please, let's, let's not do that. We have a motion by Commissioner Smith, second by Commissioner Kemp. See no further discussion. Please record your vote. Motion carried six to zero. Is there any other business coming for us? Oh. Commissioner Smith, Kemp, you recognize. Thank you. I have another uh, item I'd like to raise as to consent, which I had said before, but since we were re looking at motions, I wanted to make a motion to, um, or to not move forward on consent items over 10 acres. There's a motion by Commissioner Kemp. Is there a second? Is there a second? It dies for lack of a second. Any other business come before us? Seeing none, we adjourn and now we move into the um, workshop on um, plan amendments.
Mr. Garcia, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tony Garcia, Planning Commission staff. We have six items to present to you this morning, briefings that will be uh, heard for adoption consideration uh, on April 16th by this body. Uh, without any further ado, we'll get into the presentations. The first three amendments will be presented by uh, Ms. Krista Kelly. Good morning, Ms. Kelly. Welcome. Uh, good morning. Thank you. And whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and begin with the first item. Thank you, Krista Kelly Planning Commission staff. I'm presenting a comprehensive plan amendment 20-01. Uh, this site is located on the um, south of Knights Griffin Road and Stacy Road. Um, it's located uh, in the rural service area and within the boundary of the Thonatasasa community plan boundary. The major roadways that support this site are U.S. Highway 301 to the north, I-4 to the south, and I-75 to the west. Uh, the aerial shows a site outlined in pink. It is a seven-acre parcel within a larger 35-acre tract. Uh, currently, it's used for agricultural purposes, as are the surrounding areas. Uh, there are scattered uh, home sites, rural home sites on larger tracks, and this is a su rural subdivision on half acre tracks or lots. Um, there are natural resources in the area that are fairly significant. To the north, there's the Hillsborough River State Park, um, and to the south is the Thonatasasa, Lake Thonatasasa. This is the adopted future land use map showing this site currently designated residential one, as is all the properties surrounding this site on the south side of 301. The applicants requesting a change on this seven acre parcel to light industrial. Um, the impact of this change currently up to seven dwelling units could possibly be developed on site for non-residential uses up to 110,000 square feet or a 0.25 FAR, um, whichever is less uh, would be permitted if locational criteria was met. The proposed change to light industrial would eliminate the residential use of the property and it would increase the FAR to 0.75, which would essentially translate to 228 square feet approximately of non-residential uses. Um, that concludes my uh, briefing on this topic and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your presentation. Commissioner White, you're recognized. Thank you. Is there a, a rezoning application traveling with this one? Yes, there is. Okay, good. I was just about to say this would be a good candidate for that, given the... That's a nice segue, uh, Commissioner, because what I really wanted to inform uh, this body of uh, this morning is that 2001 and 2002 do have companion rezonings that staff is very comfortable with moving forward. Mr. Gormley and myself have discussed this. These will be scheduled out to a later point in time. It will not necessarily be heard at your April 16th date. So 2001 and 2002 will be heard by the Planning Commission on April 13th. However, they will be heard at a later time to coordinate with the uh, 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 companion rezonings for those two cases. So I thought I would mention that to you all. Thank you. Well, as, as the commissioner that championed that concept, I am so glad to see that this one has a companion rezoning traveling with it because it can certainly put, potentially put some concerns that I may have uh, at, at ease. So thank you. Okay. Um, okay, I don't hear any other questions, so go right ahead. Okay, I'll continue next with Comprehensive Plan Amendment 20-02. This site is located on the north side of Swindell Road, um, just west of County Line Road. Um, this area right here is Plant City. 
The site is in the rural service area of the county. It is within the Plant City Northeast uh, master plan area, which is outside of their city limits. However, it is an overlay of what they project in the future. The site's served by um, two major roadways, I-4 to the south and County Line Road to the east. Uh, this aerial shows the site um, just north of I-4. It's seven acres in size. It consists of two parcels. It's developed with one single family home. The remaining uh, property is undeveloped. The surrounding area, as you can see, is still rural in character, uh, consisting of large tracts and rural home sites. The adopted future land use map um, shows the site currently uh, designated residential one, as is the surrounding area. Um, this is agricultural rural one to five, and to the south of the site, there are air, two parcels um, designated light industrial. One is owned by FDOT, and it's for storm water management. The other is a private site um, that is currently undeveloped. Um, Plant City is adjacent to I-4 to the south. Um, if you can see the dotted blue line, that is the Plant City boundary. Uh, uh, this parcel is designated commercial, and the, in Plant City there are light industrial tracks. The applicants requesting light industrial, um, as you can see outlined here. The impact of this change on the seven acre project area, it would allow currently up to seven dwelling units. Um, for non-residential uses, 110,000 square feet or a 0.25 FAR, whichever is less. Uh, if the amendment uh, were approved, uh, residential uses would not be permitted and the um, FAR would increase to from 0.25 to 0.75. And again, that concludes my presentation, and any questions are welcome. Commissioner White, you recognize? Oh, I'm still in the queue for Okay, this. Oh. Commissioner Overman, you recognize? <clears throat> so, so what we're basically doing is we're taking a, a corner lot <laughs> right off of an interstate. Is there a, inter I can't tell from my backup materials uh, whether or not there's, you know, the highway, it's a highway exit or a highway on-ramp, it, it appears as though it is. Is that true? It is an interchange. However, um, it's, uh, the way that it's designed, it's fairly awkward. In order to go westbound on I-4, you would have to go west, come off of the Swindell Road, hit a frontage road along I-4 to park road to get back onto the interstate to go west. Um, to go east on I-4 from this site, you would hit County Line Road, and there's a clover leaf that leads you back onto I-4 to go east. Okay, and it's there's a residential properties all on the yeah. east side of this particular Yeah, let me get back property. to the aerial. It, it might help. I can get there. There. Yeah, as you can see, it's scattered home sites uh, along Swindell Road. It's a very narrow rural road. Um, this is that um, extension to the frontage road that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. Along this area, there's, uh, a, I believe, two churches one retail business and a cemetery, and then some scattered homes in the back. Okay. And then similarly to the previous issue regarding the zoning issue, what are we planning here? Because there's a broad list of items on the, ch on the zoning change, I mean on the use change, it's pretty broad. Um, if I were a single family homeowner there, I'd kind of like to know what are we talking about here? Absolutely. In the application, now they are not held to this um, G 
justification or what they're indicating, but what we were told at the pre-application meeting is a truck stop type of arrangement, you know, with a convenience store and pumps, gas pumps. Um, okay, all right. That's what they envision for it. Um, okay, great, thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Let me get to the last one of mine, anyways. Except, oh, sorry, Mrs. Smith. Yeah, sorry. Um, oh, it's outside the urban service area, so um, they would uh, be on well and septic? Um, in this case, water and sewer is not available in the area. It is on the south side of I-4 in Plant City. Um, mm -hmm. I discuss this informally with our liaison with Plant City. It'd be very expensive to extend it, but that is really up to the applicant. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, there is not um, Thank you. infrastructure there. Would not be up to okay. Okay. Number three. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, the next plan amendment is CPA 2003. Uh, this site's located uh, west of Tampa. It's uh, north of Lowell Road and south of Bradford Lane. It's in the urban service area. It's also within the boundary of the Carrollwood, the Greater Carrollwood Northdale Communities Plan. This area, the major uh, roadways in this area include Gun Highway to the south and Dale Mabry to the east. Um, this is the area of the site. It consists of six parcels totaling five acres. You can see the surrounding area. It's suburban in character. The lots are predominantly quarter acre lots and some smaller lots. The adopted future land use map shows the site currently designated residential four, as is the surrounding area adjacent to the site. Uh, there is uh, residential nine to the southwest on the south side of Lowell and residential 12 to the west um, and residential six also further to the west. The applications requesting residential nine um, for the project area and again uh, it's similar to the residential nine on the south side of Lowell Road. The impact of the change on this five acre project area, currently 21 dwelling units would be allowable. Uh, it would, for non-residential uses, uh, meeting locational criteria, up to 175,000 square feet, or 0.25 FAR would be permitted, whichever is less. Um, the proposed change to residential nine would essentially double that number to 48 dwelling units. Um, it would remain capped at 175,000 square feet. However, the FAR would increase to 0.50 um, FAR, again, whichever is less. Um, and again, that concludes this presentation. And any questions? Uh, yeah, I just have a real quick question. There's, um, there's still, believe it or not, in Carroll Wood, quite a bit of septic service. Is this level of density require connecting to services, stormwater, um, yeah, wa anything wastewater, under, any of the else? under half an acre. Would okay. Require. So this will require acre. connection to services. Yes. Okay, great. That was the only question I really had. Okay, number four. Okay. Commissioners, good morning. Will Augustine, Planning Commission staff. The next item before you is plan amendment briefing for Comprehensive Plan Amendment 20-04. Oh, thank you. Just push 
Okay. Comprehensive Plan Amendment 20-04 is located in North Wells Hillsborough County, just north of Limeball Avenue and south of Gun Highway. The subject site is a privately initiated map amendment in Northwest Hillsborough County and is approximately 3.42 acres in size. The aerial shows that the surrounding area is predominantly single family homes. The land use of residential four and residential six predominate the area. The subject property is north of Nixon Road, West Limeball Avenue intersection. Anderson Road is to the west and Gun Highway in the Limeball Avenue intersection is to the east. The subject site is in the urban service area. The subject site has adopted residential four land use classification. The large public quasi public parcel immediately to the east is the Xavier Canella Elementary School. To the west along Lynn Road is the Indian Cultural Center and the Hindu Temple of Florida. The area to the south of Limeball Avenue is a mixture of office, commercial, manufacturing, and light industrial uses. Residential four and residential six are the predominant land uses of the surrounding properties. The applicant is requesting a residential 12 land use change. The currently adopted land use classification of residential four allows a maximum of 13 dwelling units on the 3.42 acre site. Suburban scale neighborhood commercial, office, or multi-purpose projects are limited to 175,000 square feet or a floor area ratio of 0.25. With a land use change to residential 12, the subject site would have a potential build out of up to 41 dwelling units. Suburban scale neighborhood commercial, office, or multi-purpose projects are limited to 175,000 square feet or a floor area ratio of 0.5. And that concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you. Coach Dogman, you recognize. Um, just a quick question. Um, given the, the increased number of units, whether it be multifamily townhomes or whatever they're going to do there, uh, the road structure that's in that area, is it currently, if we had that many more elements or, or dwellings added to it, is, is the road of a, um, be able to take on that kind of capacity at this point? Um, Commissioner, I'm not sure um, I know exactly what the level of service currently is for um, for Lynn or Nixon Road yet. You do, you do or do I you do not? I do not. No, ma'am. Okay. okay. Commissioner Obermann, if I may interject very mm -hmm. quickly, Tony Garcia, Planning Commission staff. Part of our review process, this is a briefing, part of our review process is we send this out to, of course, the external departments uh, in development services and coordinating with with their various departments in the county to get information back from them, including uh, transportation information. So this is a very preliminary uh, uh, information that we're providing you as an oversight. Uh, as we get glean more information from those uh, departments in the county, we'll be able to provide that information closer to the hearing date. Okay. Now, the reason I ask is in looking at one of the illustrations, there does appear to be, you know, increasing densities in the area that uh, without necessarily what looks like any significant changes in the road structure. Um, that may be appropriate, but it's kind of hard to tell at this point. That's why I asked. So thank you. Okay. Number The next item before you is plan amendment briefing for comprehensive plan amendment 20-05. 
Plan Amendment 20-05 is located in South Hillsborough County along Highway 41, just south of Cracker Avenue and north of Big Bend Road. The subject site is a privately initiated map amendment in South Hillsborough County, which is approximately 18.65 acres in size. The aerial shows that the surrounding aerial is predominantly commercial and manufacturing businesses. The land use of heavy industrial and light industrial predominate the area. The subject property is south of Cracker Avenue in the in Highway 41 intersection. The Tampa Port Authority's Port Red Wing and the Tico Big Bend Station is to the west and the Golden Asher Scrub Preserve is to the east. The subject site is, is in the urban service area. The site has an adopted suburban mixed use land use classification. The area south of the subject site is heavy industrial, light industrial, and community mixed use 12. North of the subject site is mostly residential four, suburban mixed use six, and heavy industrial. Heavy industrial, light industrial, suburban mixed use six are the predominant land uses for the surrounding properties. The applicant is requesting a heavy industrial land use classification change. The currently adopted land use classification of suburban mixed use six allows a maximum of 111 dwelling units on the 18.65 acre site. Suburban scale neighborhood commercial, office or multi-purpose projects are limited to 175,000 square feet or a floor area ratio of 0.25. With the land use change to heavy industrial, the subject site would have a potential build out of up to over 609,000 square feet or a floor area ratio of 0.75. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you, Commissioner Smith, to recognize. Thank you. Um, it, I know in this area of Gibsonton, there are still some areas that um, do not have urban services, well, that, that, don't, that are on septic, that don't have a sewer. Is this one? Currently, this site is um, undeveloped. So yeah. is there sewer in the area that they could tie into or, or not? Do we know? There is, okay, the, Commissioner yeah. Merman is saying there is, and that's something I'd be looking at when this comes back. Um, do you, uh, you, I didn't see you put up the existing land use map. You put back. up the adopted. Do you have uh, that one, the existing land use? It's in our backup. Um, I, don't, I don't have it as, okay. as a slide, I'm sorry. Well, all right, um, let me just ask you this. So it's in the coastal high hazard area it's in a floodplain, and it's between, you can see Golden Aster Scrub over there is the light green. This area that is heavy industrial, you can tell it has a lot of wetlands, and the back half of this site is, is wetlands as well. And then across the street is the Fred and Ida Sh uh, Scrub uh, Schultz Preserve. Uh, all of this is an area full of significant wildlife habitat, including the endangered endemic uh, Florida golden aster. Um, so I would, I, I would like to ask if it's possible when in between now and when we hear this again for uh, uh, Forest Herberville of uh, the uh, conservation lands um, departments to provide comment or review. Is that possible on comprehensive plan amendments the way it is on zonings? Absolutely, okay. uh, Commissioner Wheel. Uh, if there's a specific request that you have regarding uh, a certain function in the surrounding area or certain existing conditions in the area, uh, we'll be more than happy to, to do that and extend the, that to uh, the appropriate agencies for review and response. Great. Because, and even though, you know, this shows up as heavy industrial around it, the, the area between this and Golden Aster Scrub, on the existing land use, it shows up as blue public, the same 
same uh, comp plan designation or the same existing land use as the Golden Aster Scrub. So that's not exactly a future land use category. For the purpose of uh, the existing land use categories are used to try and reflect the existing conditions uh, of the surrounding built environment. Uh, however, we do not use the existing land use on a regular basis as those layers that we get that information from from the property appraiser tend to differ slightly from what the future land use categories uh, are and how we would classify properties so we that's why we don't really use that as a point of reference for you mm -hmm. okay just do, just so long as we get conservation uh comment on here to to talk about what the ramifications might be for the wetlands for the significant wildlife habitat of heavy industrial uses that that are possible in this area duly noted okay. thank you Mr. Merman, you recognize. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, yes, I think we'll just have to wait and see what's being proposed there. I'm, I don't know. I haven't heard anything. Um, other than the fact, I will tell you, we need places um, that have jobs. And so I think, you know, once we get all the information, we'll be able to see how we can move forward <laughs> in in a good way um there is sewer in the area and not as much as i'd like mm -hmm. and this is like big ben right now now that i got that done and john poor john lyons if i don't mention it to him every day it's every other um you know how can we get sewer um, in the area so i know and uh, george cassidy they're working on it and it's just very 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 expensive as you all know so um, but they're working on it and I know there are plans and I didn't know if y'all realize this but when you convert septic to sewer it takes like seven to nine years it's a crazy amount of time uh, that it takes so um, these are things we really need to work on when we see it we got to get on it quick because uh, it just takes so much time. But I'll look forward to hearing the comments uh, that come back from the different agencies um, that would be involved with this project. Thank you, Mr. Yates. Yes, that, uh, all of the reports that we get from the reviewing agencies, of course, are clean, uh, contained in the report that we present to you for your adoption hearing. And of course, uh, we should have them, uh, I, I anticipate, of course, we will have them prior to the hearing when we normally brief you all, in case you might have bring up those specific questions again. Thank you. Mr. Overman, you recognize. Um, I too am, am looking at the, the environmental area, looking at the illustrations, looking at the what appears to be half of the property is wetlands. Um, there's a, a great deal of what appears to be a creek or a river that runs through that and through all that area down into ultimately into Apollo Beach. So uh, the the categories what we're moving from to what we're moving to would appear to be something that would possibly offer a, a very hazardous situation to the wildlife in the area to get in the wetlands in the area. So I'm a little concerned about taking that level of heavy industrial um, from what it was previously. Um, so I'm, I have some concerns about the move here without having a full understanding of the environmental impact all for the entire region, because it really does run right alongside that piece of property. Uh, it's not obvious from the aerial, but it is obvious from one of the other illustrations that shows you know, the tributaries that run along through there and are driven by that particular area. And while I guess I want jobs, um, if it causes what appears to be a lot of wetland absorbable area in that area, environmental hazard to the to the, that community, um, especially that which is on well and septic still possibly. Um, I'm going to look at this very closely before I would agree to take this move. A6.
Good morning, commissioners. My name is Jawan Haley, Planning Commission staff. I will uh, be presenting to you the briefing for the Hillsborough County uh, Comprehensive Plan Amendment Amendment, I'm sorry, 20-06. This is a privately initiated amendment. The request is to change the land use category for the subject property. Uh, the subject property is 5508 Orient Road from commercial mixed use 12 to office commercial 20. So uh, the subject site, it is located in East Hillsborough County. Uh, it is within the urban service area. So it is located on 1.46 acres. It is located here in the, I can get the mouse here, the uh, northwestern quadrant of the Orient Road in Hillsborough, East Hillsborough Avenue intersection. Again, it is within the urban service area. The existing land use uh, is a mobile home park. It is within the limits of the East Lake Orient Community Plan. So uh, Orient Road, immediately to the east of the subject property. It is a two-lane collector. Uh, east Hillsboro Avenue to the south, it is a four-lane arterial. Uh, to provide you with a bit of context for the surrounding area, uh, Cross Orient Road uh, to the east, this is a residential uh, area. Um, immediately to the north across Zemus Road, uh, up of the subject property. There is some residential development to the north here. Uh, the majority of the uh, development, however, to the west, uh, abutting uh, the parcel to the west is uh, light industrial, uh, commercial, non-residential development. The Hard Rock Casino and Hotel are across Hillsboro Avenue to the southeast. Um, along here, there are additional uh, non-residential development and further south, there is some residential development um, going further back across East Hillsboro Avenue. So this is just a layout of the land use map here. This is the commercial mixed use category. Again, this is the subject parcel that is the current adopted land use category. Here, as I stated earlier, Earlier, the non-residential development is mostly Office Commercial 20 here. Going north, there is Research Corporate Park. Further north, Light Industrial Land Use Category. All back here is Community Mixed Use 12, including the uh, Hard Rock Casino Hotel. There's OC20 along East Hillsboro and Residential 6 going further south. So the... So here, um, this is just showing the, uh, the, the, the category change, the proposed future land use map. So uh, it would extend OC20 further to Orient Road. So the impacts, uh, currently the CMU 12 that is currently adopted allows a density of up to 12 dwelling units per acre. Uh, the maximum density is 12, dwell 12 dwelling units. The current uh, floor area ratio is uh, 0 0.50. That this allows for a maximum intensity of 31,798 square feet. Uh, the proposed change would um, allow the density to go up to 20 dwelling units uh, per acre for OC20. The maximum density would be 29 dwelling units. Uh, that this change would increase the floor area ratio, the floor area ratio to 0.75. Uh, the maximum intensity would be 47,698 square feet. I just want to point out that both of the categories, they are not subject to commercial locational criteria. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions this any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. And I see no questions. Is there anything else, Ms. Garcia? No, sir. That concludes our briefing this morning. Thank you very much for Thank your time. Thank you. We'll adjourn.